January 1744. A carriage hurried through the Russian winter, carrying a 14-year-old German princess to St. Petersburg. Christened Sophie Friederike Augusta, in Russia, she would take a new name, Catherine. She was to marry the heir to the Russian throne, and must have imagined her future in this frozen land and dreamt of a loving husband. But her hopes were in vain. Her marriage would be loveless. This young princess would instead fall in love with Russia. Eighteen years later, the year 1762. At the Russian court, the age of elaborate wigs and lavish balls was coming to an end. They held no interest for Empress Elizabeth's successor, the 34-year-old Peter Fyodorovich. Not even those close to the new emperor knew quite what to expect from him. He fidgeted constantly through ceremonies, liked to play with toy soldiers, and often said out loud that he'd rather rule a civilized country like Sweden than a wild one like Russia. Chapter 1, Peter III Fyodorovich. Peter was born Karl Peter Ulrich, son of the German Duke of Holstein, a nephew of King Karl XII of Sweden. His mother was Anna Petrovna, daughter of Peter the Great, making him heir to both the Russian and Swedish thrones. Peter, orphaned at the age of 11, was brought to Russia by his aunt, Empress Elizabeth. She had him convert to Russian Orthodoxy and renounce his claim to the Swedish throne. At the age of 17, he married the 16-year-old German princess of Anhalt Zerbst, who converted to Orthodoxy and took the name Catherine. Peter quickly discovered he had nothing in common with his young wife. Although she was beautiful, he found her dull. He played his violin for her and tried to include her in his own hobbies, but she was interested neither in his music nor his toy soldiers. Catherine was intelligent and well-educated, but in Russia, she felt isolated. Catherine confided her innermost feelings to her diary. I see very clearly that the Grand Duke doesn't love me at all, she wrote. I will be very unhappy with this man. Peter's antics, meanwhile, exasperated those around him. His courtiers painted an unflattering portrait, suggesting he'd inherited Peter the Great's love of drinking as well as his wild, unpredictable behavior, which baffled and infuriated his advisors. They reported that he talked such nonsense in front of foreign ambassadors that it made our hearts bleed with shame. Peter behaved erratically throughout his adult life. Some thought he had a form of mental impairment. Others thought his development had been affected by a serious bout of smallpox as a teenager. Nevertheless, Peter received a brilliant education and excelled in the natural sciences, mathematics, geography and fortification. He spoke German, French and even some Latin although his Russian remained poor. The prospect of becoming Emperor of Russia appealed to him not at all. In contrast, his wife Catherine was determined to be accepted in her new homeland. She practiced her Russian lessons late into the night and read books about Russian history and the lives of the saints she even studied the old Slavonic language of the church. She got up early to help the servants stoke the palace fireplaces and practice her Russian with them. Soon, she spoke the language fluently 
though she never completely lost her German accent. When Peter III became emperor in 1762, he began a period of frantic legislation. In 186 days, he signed 192 decrees. He abolished the hated secret chancellery and the use of torture and allowed 20,000 people to return from exile in Siberia. He ended the persecution of the so-called old believers and took land from the monasteries and gave it to the state. He ordered that babies should be baptized in warm water. He approved the formation of Russia's first state bank and the introduction of the first banknotes. He declared forests to be a national resource and granted new civil liberties to the nobility, exempting them from compulsory military service and allowing them to travel abroad for the first time. There were rumors that Peter intended further sweeping reforms of the church. He certainly showed little respect, laughing, joking, and talking loudly through services. In contrast, his wife Catherine remained standing through long services, observed all the fasts, confessed her sins, and received communion regularly. Her calm and pious demeanor made the emperor look like an oaf. Catherine never had any illusions about her husband, even in the early days of their marriage. She recalled one incident in her diary. When I entered the chambers of His Imperial Highness, she wrote, I was shocked to see that he had hanged a huge rat. I asked him what it meant. He explained that the rat had committed a criminal offense. It had climbed over the wall of his cardboard fortress and eaten two guards that were on duty. So he ordered the criminal to be tried according to military law. The rat was hanged at once and was to remain there for three days as an example to others. Catherine and Peter were completely unalike. They shared no interests and had nothing to say to each other. And there was another problem. Everyone at court knew that Peter and Catherine did not sleep together. After a few years, it was less an item of court gossip than a looming dynastic crisis. Russia and the Romanovs needed an heir. After nine years of marriage, Catherine finally became pregnant. According to one account, Peter had surgery to correct a condition that had prevented him consummating the marriage. According to another account, Catherine was seduced by her chamberlain, Sergei Soltikov. In any event, in 1754, at the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, Catherine gave birth to a son, Paul Petrovich. As far as Empress Elizabeth was concerned, Catherine had fulfilled her only duty to provide the Romanov line with an heir. She now intended to raise the precious child herself. Catherine's infant son was taken away from her. For several years, she lived virtually alone. It gave her plenty of time for her favorite pastime, reading. For a Russian Grand Duchess, Catherine had unusual taste. Her favorite writers were all French philosophers, men such as Diderot, Voltaire, and Montesquieu. Her other great passion was for handsome men. Her first lover, Sergei Soltikov, was soon sent on a diplomatic mission to Sweden. But Catherine soon found a new favorite, Stanisław August Poniatowski a young Polish noble attached to the British Embassy. They had a daughter named Anna, and in time, Catherine would help Poniatowski to become the last Polish king in history. When Catherine turned 30, she took a new lover, a handsome, boisterous guards officer named Grigory Orlov. He and his four brothers, 
all officers in the guards, wielded enormous influence and effectively controlled the loyalty of their regiments. Catherine was cultivating powerful allies in St. Petersburg. By the time Peter became emperor, husband and wife were barely speaking to each other. Peter didn't even know that Catherine was pregnant again, this time with Grigory Orlov's child. The birth of an illegitimate child could be the excuse Peter was waiting for to get rid of his unloved wife. It had to be kept secret. On the date the baby was due, Catherine's Chamberlain, knowing Peter loved watching huge fires, went to an extraordinary length to lure him away from the palace. He ran to the city and set fire to his own house. Peter set off to see the great blaze while Catherine gave birth to a son in a far wing of the Winter Palace. In time, the emperor discovered the existence of both his wife's illegitimate children. He remarked casually, God knows where my wife gets her pregnancies from. I don't know. Peter was not a faithful husband either. His mistress was Elizabeth Varantsova, a lady in waiting, and he wanted to marry her. But first, they would have to remove one major obstacle, Catherine. Peter planned to imprison his wife and their son Paul in the Schlüsselburg fortress near St. Petersburg. Rooms had already been prepared for them. Catherine knew she had to make her move first. She also knew that the emperor had made himself many powerful enemies close to home. The King of Prussia, Frederick the Great, was Peter III's idol. It didn't matter to Peter that Russia and Prussia had been at war for several years. When Peter became emperor, he immediately made peace with Prussia, giving away Russian conquests. Then he made his own guard regiments adopt Prussian uniform and brought in strict new codes of discipline, also based on the Prussian system. The guard regiments, pampered for years, were outraged. The guards were the elite troops of the Russian army. Based on the toy regiments created by Peter the Great for his war games, the Priobrzhensky, Zemanovsky and Izmailovsky regiments retained a close relationship with the sovereign. The Lieb guards guarded the imperial palace and were a political force to be reckoned with. In a span of 37 years, the guards were involved in no fewer than six palace revolutions. June 28, 1762, the Montplaisir Palace, 6 a.m. Catherine was woken by Alexei Orlov, Grigory's brother. It's time to get up, he told her. Everything is ready for your proclamation. She dressed quickly and got into a carriage. A few miles outside St. Petersburg, they met Grigory Orlov and went on to the barracks of the guard regiments, where they were welcomed with cheers. Catherine had been preparing the ground for this move for months. 10 a.m. Peter was still asleep at Oranienbaum, 20 miles outside the city. At noon, a huge crowd followed Catherine's carriage as it drew up outside the Winter Palace. It was met by a welcoming committee of senior state officials. At the Peterhof Palace, Peter was told that the Empress had vanished. He searched her chambers in person, looking inside her wardrobes and under her bed. When it was discovered that Catherine was in the city gathering support, he sent messengers to find out what was going on. None of them returned. Instead, they joined Catherine. Peter took a boat to the naval base at Kronstadt, hoping that the fleet remained loyal to him. A galley carrying all the ladies of court followed him. The emperor intended to use them as hostages since their husbands had all sided with Catherine. But the fortress at Kronstadt opened fire on Peter's boat. The commandant announced that he recognized no emperor. Russia was ruled by Empress Catherine. 
St. Petersburg, the people gathered on the shore with sticks and stones to prevent the emperor returning to the capital. 24 hours later, after learning that the Senate, army and fleet had all sworn allegiance to Catherine, Peter agreed to sign an act of abdication. The guards arrived to escort him to the royal hunting lodge at Ropsha, a few miles outside the city. Peter went out to the carriage, handed his sword to an officer and fainted. Catherine had no legitimate claim to the throne. By precedent, she could claim no more than to be acting as regent on behalf of her infant son, Paul. Catherine, however, chose to present her palace revolution as a fulfillment of the people's will. Her ascension to the throne was, she declared, by the will of all our subjects. The immediate question was what to do with her husband, Peter. He'd written to her in French, addressing her as Her Majesty and swearing not to conspire against her or her government. He'd added a postscript in bad Russian. I also beg you, honoring your will in everything, to be allowed to go to faraway lands. It was too risky to let Peter go abroad. Perhaps she should send him to the Schlisselberg fortress, where he could join another former emperor, deposed more than 20 years before by the Empress Elizabeth, Ivan VI. But two legitimate ex-emperors posed too great a threat to an illegitimate German-born empress. A week after the coup, Catherine received a letter from Alexei Orlov, who was keeping Peter under house arrest at Ropsha. It contained the news that Peter was dead. The circumstances of his death remain unclear. The official cause was hemorrhoidal colic, but he was almost certainly murdered. Two years later, the second problem also resolved itself. During a rescue attempt at the Schlisselberg fortress, Ivan VI was killed by his guards. In September 1762, two months after the coup, Empress Catherine was crowned in Moscow. Chapter 2. Catherine II Alexeyevna. At Catherine's coronation, 1,200 poods of silver, more than 19 tons, were given out to the people. Crowds were then treated to a masquerade involving thousands of musicians, giants, dwarfs and jesters. They ate fried beef and drank from fountains of Rhenish wine. The festivities lasted three months. The main attraction was the great imperial crown containing 4,936 diamonds, weighing 2,858 carats in total. On top, a red spinel, weighing 398 carats, and 72 Indian pearls. Its value, 2 million rubles, about $200 million today. Catherine was the first Russian empress to dedicate most of her time to work, not her own pleasure. Compared to her predecessors, she led an orderly life. She preferred plain food. Her favorite dish was boiled beef with salted cucumbers, and she hardly ever drank. Even during state banquets, she drank black currant juice instead of wine. She also kept to a strict daily routine. Catherine rose at 6 a.m., read until 8.30, then worked on papers with her secretaries from 9 to 11. From 11 to 1, she met with courtiers. And from 1 to 2, she had lunch. Courtiers read aloud to her between 2 and 4. Then she received visitors until 6 p.m. Then she might play cards for a few hours before dining at 9 and going to bed no later than 10.
philosophical treatises that Catherine had read in her youth now began to bear fruit. The Empress decided to establish a new style of government in Russia, enlightened absolutism. Its main principles were to be freedom of thought and speech, and equality for all classes before the law. Russia still used a legal code that dated back to 1649, known as the Sobornya Uluzhenya. Catherine ordered the summoning of a legislative commission to debate new laws for Russia. Its delegates were to be drawn from all the classes and regions of the empire, and were to come to Moscow bearing written instructions from their constituents. Before the commission met, the Empress wrote down her own ideas about the law in a document that became known as the Nakaz, or Instruction. It took two years to write and contained more than 600 clauses. It discussed the rule of law, the abolition of the death penalty, the presumption of innocence, the concept of liberty, the different classes, and serfdom. The Nakaz provoked extreme responses in Russia and abroad. In France, the birthplace of the Enlightenment, it was banned as dangerously liberal. Now, as her legislative commission was convened, the eyes of Europe were on Catherine and her daring experiment in legal reform. The legislative commission that was to draft the new legal code was made up of all classes except the serfs and clergy. 564 deputies were selected, 30% were nobles, 39% were townsmen, 14% were peasants, 5% bureaucrats, and 12% were representatives of other estates, such as Cossacks and frontier tribesmen. They met in no fewer than 203 sessions. The commission met inside the Kremlin. Catherine secretly watched proceedings from a hidden gallery, used a hundred years before by the Tsaritsa and royal princesses in an age when women weren't allowed to join men at banquets. The more the commission talked, the clearer it was there was little common ground between the different estates. Sometimes it seemed the soldiers were the only thing that stopped them from attacking each other. One issue bridged the gap between the estates. Merchants, Cossacks and industrialists wanted the right to own serfs, like the nobles did. While Catherine was striving to nurture liberty, the delegates wanted the opposite and weren't afraid to say so. The only thing on which the deputies were unanimous was their desire to present Catherine with the titles the Great, the Wise, and the Mother of the Nation. Catherine wasn't impressed. She wrote irritably, I told them to work on the laws, and they do an anatomy of my qualities. Only God is wise. Great, history will judge. But she welcomed one title, Mother of the Nation. With the commission deadlocked, Catherine took matters into her own hands. She ruled by decree, prohibiting the export of grain, imposing price controls on salt, and creating new laws against corruption. But trouble was brewing for Russia abroad. The growing might of the Russian Empire was a source of growing unease for France. When Catherine put her former lover, Stanisław Poniatowski, on the Polish throne, she antagonized France yet further. She had also broken a promise to Turkey not to interfere in Polish affairs. In October 1768, under pressure from French agents, the Turkish Sultan declared war on Russia. Catherine sent her best troops and generals against the enemy. The Empress had a flair for recognizing talent and promoting those with ability. One beneficiary was Count Peter Rumyantsev, former favorite of Peter III. He'd expected to be dismissed after Peter's overthrow, but instead, Catherine gave him command of an army. 
Count Alexei Orlov was considered by many to be debauched and dishonest, yet Catherine gave him command of a naval squadron. Alexander Suvorov was an unassuming 30-year-old major when he first met the Empress. She gave him her portrait as a gift, a moment he later described as paving his way to glory. According to some estimates, he went on to win 93 battles for Russia and was one of the few generals in history never to be defeated. In July 1770, the two armies met at the River Lager in modern Moldova. Rumyantsev smashed an Ottoman army that outnumbered him more than two to one, 38,000 Russians defeating 80,000 Turks. That same day at Chesma in the Aegean Sea, Alexei Orlov led his naval squadron into action. He too won a stunning victory against a much larger force, 32,000 Russians defeating 73,000 Turks. On August 1st, 1770, near the river Kagul, Count Rumyantsev attacked and defeated a Turkish army that outnumbered him five to one. His 32,000 men routing 150,000 Turks. Four years later, at the village of Kozluja in modern Bulgaria, Suvorov won the last great land battle of the war once more attacking and defeating a larger Ottoman force, his 25,000 men putting to flight 40,000 Turks. The string of victories against the Ottoman Empire caught everyone's attention. Soon, ambitious young officers were traveling from across Europe to seek service with the Russian army. Among them was a Spaniard, Jose de Ribas, the future founder of the city of Odessa, he was nearly joined by a young Corsican officer named Napoleon Bonaparte, who changed his mind because foreigners were hired with a demotion in rank. Meanwhile, at home, Catherine was waging another war with her lover, Grigory Orlov. Her favorite had a furious temper, while she could be jealous and resentful they would often quarrel furiously, make up, and quarrel again. They had had a son together and lived like husband and wife. Grigori wanted their relationship to be recognized as such and made official through marriage. But Catherine was worried it would undermine her position as empress. She asked her closest advisor, Count Panin, for guidance. He told her, the Russian Empress can do anything she wants, but Mrs. Oliver can't be the Empress of Russia. Where Panin leant against the wall, his powdered wig left a mark. From that moment, it became a ritual for courtiers to press their foreheads against the mark, hoping for Panin's courage when they had to give bad news to the Empress. After 12 years, Catherine finally tired of Grigory Orlov. That year, 1774, plague struck Moscow. Every day, a thousand people perished. Officials fled the city and riots broke out. Orlov volunteered to go into the plague-ridden city. With the guard regiments, he restored order, organized the burial of the dead, and opened hospitals with his own money. In one month, the epidemic subsided. Orlov returned to St. Petersburg in triumph. The Empress's love was briefly rekindled. But two years later, while Orlov was away negotiating with the Turks, she found a new favorite, a young officer named Alexander Vasilichkov. When Orlov found out, he was furious. He broke off negotiations and rushed home to see Catherine. But her courier met him en route and handed him strict instructions to go to his palace at Gachina and not to come to court. Grigori eventually calmed down and a few months later was allowed to return to court. 
he and the Empress remained friends for the rest of their lives. Catherine and Peter's son, Paul, was now nearly grown up. Many expected Catherine to hand over power to him soon or make him her co-ruler. It was a time when Catherine needed people around her whose loyalty was beyond question. So the Empress turned to a 35-year-old Major General, a devoted and trusted friend, Grigory Alexandrovich Potemkin. Catherine and Potemkin soon became lovers. She later wrote of her need to him. My heart cannot be content even for an hour without love. If you want me to be yours forever, show me friendship as well as affection, but love me and always speak truthfully. She called him my student, my friend, my idol. Soon, she couldn't bear to be apart from him. And when he left the capital, she wrote tender letters addressing him as my dear husband. Their affair began in the spring of 1774. It's widely suspected, though it has never been proven, that they were secretly married just a few months later in the Cathedral of St. Samson in St. Petersburg. It was also rumored Catherine later bore him a daughter, Elizabeth, who took the surname Temkina. But even this affair brought Catherine only fleeting happiness. Catherine and Potemkin were both headstrong and always tried to impose their will on the other. Eventually, Catherine had had enough. While Potemkin was away in the provinces, Catherine took a new lover, Peter Zavodovsky. Potemkin wrote to Catherine threatening to kill the man who'd taken his place. But she had made her decision and told Potemkin, the first sign of loyalty is obedience. Zavodovsky was her favorite for just a year before he was replaced by Semyon Zoric, a cavalry officer 14 years Catherine's junior. The next lover was even younger, 25 years her junior. Catherine chose her own lovers, but for counsel and company, she always returned to Potemkin. Many years later, Catherine's last favorite, Platon Zubov, 38 years her junior, wrote, the Empress always gave in to Potemkin's wishes and feared him just like a demanding husband. She often pointed to him as the example I should follow. It was the tireless Potemkin who oversaw the colonization of Russia's new lands in the south, known as Novorossiya, New Russia. For centuries, this territory had been ruled by the Muslim Tatars of the Crimean Khanate. But in 1774, as part of the peace treaty of Kuchuk Kanaji, it became part of the Russian Empire. A few years later, taking advantage of Tatar weakness, Catherine annexed Crimea itself. In just four years, Potemkin brought 400,000 settlers to these new lands and founded the cities of Yekaterinoslav, Nikolaev, Mariupol, Kherson, and Sevastopol, the new home of Russia's Black Sea Fleet. Its warships built in the shipyards in Taganrog and Kherson. Potemkin invited Catherine to inspect her new lands in person. He organized every aspect of the trip, down to the tiniest detail. It was like nothing else in history. The Imperial Party consisted of 3,000 people, traveling in 14 carriages and 164 sleighs, including 40 spares. Catherine herself traveled in a specially constructed giant sleigh, housing an office, a parlor with room for eight, a card table, and a library. It was pulled by 40 horses. The trip lasted six months and covered 6,034 kilometers. At every one of the 375 relay stations, 550 fresh horses were waiting, 
as well as fresh provisions, six cows and calves, 30 hens and geese, 500 eggs, 80 kilos of flour, sugar and butter, six hams, eight kilos of coffee, a barrel of herrings, 50 lemons and three buckets of wine. The Empress visited 35 cities, each of which welcomed her with great fanfare and celebration. At Balaclava, she was greeted by an all-female regiment of Greek Amazons, while at Poltava, 50,000 extras reenacted Russia's great victory over the Swedes. Catherine's great tour of the South became legendary and gave rise to myths of its own. Amongst them was the story that Potemkin tried to trick Catherine about the number of new settlements by lining their route with fake villages built from plywood with actors playing the role of peasants. The story gave birth to the phrase Potemkin village, a fake construction or facade that creates the illusion of prosperity. But the towns and villages of new Russia were real. The myth was created by foreign observers, reluctant to believe that Russia could so quickly consolidate its hold on such a vast region. Welcomed and acclaimed across new Russia, Catherine was made to truly feel like the mother of the nation. The Austrian emperor Joseph II and other foreigners traveling with her were full of admiration. This, of course, was Catherine's desire to make a powerful international impression. The Ottoman Empire, however, was incensed by this triumphal procession and declared war in a bid to win back its lost lands. The result was a series of brilliant Russian victories on land and sea. The bright stars of Rumyantsev and Suvorov were joined by a new Russian naval hero, Fyodor Ushakov. In the course of two years, he fought four battles against the Ottoman fleet, all of them won or drawn, despite always facing superior numbers. His bold tactics rewrote Russian textbooks on naval warfare and would be studied by Russian naval officers for generations to come. When peace was made, the Russian frontier advanced to the river Nistra, taking in the fortresses of Achukov and Kajibi, future city of Odessa. Russia's status as a great European power was now assured. No European state now dared to act without first considering the reaction of Empress Catherine. The empire's internal situation, however, was cause for serious concern. The most influential woman of her age faced constant challenges to her rule. During the first 10 years of her reign, seven pretenders to the throne emerged, all claiming to be Tsar Peter III, having miraculously escaped death. In the 11th year of her reign, an eighth pretender emerged and declared war on the Empress. His name was Yemelyan Pugachev. Until recently, he'd been a common Cossack from the Don region, a veteran of the Seven Years' War. Returning home, he helped some friends desert, and as a consequence, became a fugitive himself. He rode to the Urals and told the Cossacks that he was the true Emperor Peter III, back from the dead. Then he stirred up a peasant's revolt. Ugachev's manifesto promised all things to all men land for the peasants, freedom for the Cossacks, justice for the Tatars, Kazakhs, Bashkirs, and Kalmuks, 
He promised to protect the people from corrupt government officials. Live free like the beasts of the steppe, he told them. Pugachev's people lived free indeed, taking whatever they wanted by force, robbing from the poor as well as the rich. A month after Pugachev's manifesto, the Empress responded with one of her own. She informed her subjects that a fugitive Cossack named Yemelyan Pugachev had gathered a band of thieves and vagabonds around him and dared to style himself emperor. She called on his followers to give up their ways or face severe penalties, including death. But it was too late. In just a month, Pugachev's 80 followers became 8,000. In three months, he had an army of 24,000 men, made up of peasants, Cossacks, Bashkirs, and Kalmuks from the steppe. The rebellion had plunged the whole region into anarchy. Catherine would have to do more than write a manifesto to regain control. Of the Euro region's 89 factories, 23 were completely destroyed and 33 more were looted. Violence cost the factory owners around 1 million rubles, worth about 5 billion rubles today, or 140 million US dollars. The losses to factory workers and peasants, whose houses were looted or burned down, and whose cattle and property was stolen, amounted to about another 1 million rubles. Many people were killed or went missing amid the violence. The official death toll was 2,716. Catherine sent government troops to crush the rebels, but they stumbled into disaster after disaster. Three provinces, Kazan, Nizhigorod, and Voronezh, were soon in flames. Because of the war against the Turks to the south, Catherine had no more troops to send. But as soon as peace was made with the Turks, regular troops flooded the region the revolt was suppressed. The defeated Cossacks handed over their renegade leader to the government. Ugachev was brought to Moscow in a cage, like a wild steppe beast. His treatment and interrogation were authorized by the Empress herself. Ugachev, along with six other ringleaders, was sentenced to death. On January 10th, 1775, in front of a huge crowd in Moscow's Balatnaya Square, one of the most dangerous and charismatic rebels in Russian history was executed by quartering. By law, Pugachev's legs should have been cut off first, then his arms, and only then his head. But by personal order of the Empress, Pugachev and his comrades were granted a small mercy. They were beheaded first. The Empress later declared Pugachev's rebellion to be a national tragedy and ordered its events to pass into eternal oblivion and deep silence. Catherine believed that the rebellion had been caused by the state of Russia's provincial government, archaic, incompetent and corrupt. The entire administration of the empire needed overhauling. It was to this great task that Catherine turned next. My quick quill will be the death of me, she wrote to the French philosopher Voltaire. I've never written so much in my life. The result was 216 pages on reform of the provincial administration of the Russian Empire. Catherine's reforms began with a complete reorganization of the empire, doubling the number of provinces from 23 to 50. Each province was subdivided into between 10 and 20 districts, all of roughly equal size. These new provinces and districts would be the new basis for local government. 216 towns received city status. 
Each city, from the capital downwards, became a separate administrative unit, divided into its own districts and quarters. This system was in use with few changes until the Russian Revolution. Some of its measures even remain in use today. Then, shocking news arrived from France that would hold Catherine's reforms in their tracks. Louis XVI, King of France, had been guillotined. Catherine had never been a friend of the king, but the news made her physically ill. The French Revolution was the largest political and social upheaval of the age. France's monarchy was overthrown in 1792, and a republic based on freedom and equality was proclaimed. The ground had been laid by Enlightenment philosophers such as Voltaire, Montesquieu, Rousseau and Diderot. Now revolutionaries like Robespierre, Marat and Danton sought to fashion a new state from their ideas. The Empress was thrown into panic. The French Revolution had been inspired by the same ideals that drove her. Was she paving the way for a Russian Robespierre or Marat? Would she be the next monarch to lose her head? She offered to send Suvorov and an army of 60,000 men to crush the revolution. It did not happen, but from henceforth Catherine looked on her old Enlightenment ideals with deep mistrust. Catherine kept the title Mother of the Nation close to her heart. There was hardly any area of Russian life she didn't look at to see how it might be improved, from provincial administration to the duties of Russian midwives. Her reign saw the birth of Russian journalism and satire. She even contributed to such magazines herself. In 1795, she joined forces with Frederick William of Prussia and Emperor Joseph of Austria to carve up Poland, annexing territory in Belarus, Western Ukraine, Lithuania and Latvia. She wrote no fewer than three dozen literary works, including 11 comedies and seven operas. Her reign saw the construction of great buildings and monuments in Moscow and St. Petersburg, designed by men of genius such as Bajanov and Kazakov. She initiated smallpox vaccination in Russia, vaccinating herself and her son Paul. She amassed an unrivaled collection of artwork that became the basis of the world-famous Hermitage Museum. She was a patron of Russian artists who themselves became masters, Fyodor Rokotov, Dmitry Levitsky, and Vladimir Baravakovsky. The scale and breadth of her achievements were awe-inspiring. No one could doubt her right to be called Catherine the Great. For Russia, Catherine's 34-year reign was a period of dramatic growth. The population of the empire soared from 19 to 36 million. Conquests of her reign surpassed even those of Peter the Great. 29 new provinces were created and 144 new towns founded. The army doubled in size from 162,000 to 312,000. The navy grew from six frigates and 21 ships of the line to 40 frigates and 67 ships of the line. Her generals and admirals won an incredible 78 military victories. Meanwhile, industrial output boomed. The output of cast iron tripled. Russia became the greatest producer of cast iron in the world, overtaking the former world leader, Great Britain. The value of Russia's external trade rose from more than 9 million rubles per year to nearly 46 million rubles per year. State revenue quadrupled from 16 million to 69 million rubles. Catherine built on the foundations laid by Peter the Great 80 years before to create a giant and powerful new Russian Empire. Many later generations would look back to her reign as the zenith of Russian imperial glory. But forever mindful of the limitations of power, she compared her own work to a drop of water falling in the ocean. In 1796, in her 67th year, Catherine prepared to draft a decree on her succession. She intended to pass over her unloved son Paul, 
to make her 19-year-old favorite grandson, Alexander, her heir. She did not live to see it completed. On November 6, 1796, Catherine the Great died of a stroke. Her 42-year-old son, Paul, became emperor. In just one month, it was plain to see why the Empress had tried to remove him from the succession. Catherine the Great was never wrong. November 1796, Grand Duke Paul Petrovich strode through the corridors of the Winter Palace as his mother, Catherine the Great, lay dying. He was looking for Catherine's secret will, the one piece of paper that stood between him and the throne. Unless it was destroyed, the throne would pass directly to his son, Alexander, as Catherine had wished. Unlike his father, Alexander seemed born to rule. He had every natural gift, charm, intellect, and wit. The only thing he lacked was the desire to rule. Catherine's will never saw the light of day. The moment Paul had been waiting for for 34 years had arrived. At last, he was emperor. But in little more than four years, Alexander would stand over his father's bloodied body, and Catherine would at last have her way. Paul's birth had been a joyous event. As the great-grandson of Peter the Great, his destiny had always been to continue the Romanov line and one day rule Russia. But all his early years had been lived in the shadow of his mother, Catherine the Great. The eternal prince became lonely and secretive, retreating into an imaginary world of his own creation. Many thought he was mad and christened him the Russian Hamlet. Chapter 1, Paul I Petrovich. Immediately after Paul's birth, he was taken from his mother by Empress Elizabeth, who raised him as her own. His mother, Catherine, was granted almost no access to her son. His father, the future Peter III, also saw little of the boy. There were rumors at court that Paul's real father was not Peter, but a courtier, Sergei Sontikov. Catherine herself encouraged these rumors, which undermined the husband she later deposed. Stories about Paul's uncertain parentage delighted courtiers, but as the prince grew up, the resemblance to Peter III was plain to see, both physically and in his strange mannerisms. Like his father, Paul liked to march around his palaces as though on military parade. He frequently baffled courtiers and ambassadors with his inane remarks, leaving his wife, the 
German princess Maria Fyodorovna to cover up his strange behavior as best she could, just as Catherine had to do for Emperor Peter. Nevertheless, Empress Elizabeth adored her great-nephew, Paul. She began to consider making him her successor and bypassing his father, Peter, who she and many others believed was insane. To prepare Paul for rule, she found him the best tutors in Russia. Paul studied five languages, history, literature, mathematics, science, draftsmanship, and architecture, as well as riding, fencing, dance, carpentry, and chess. Paul himself insisted on studying the military sciences. To help with navigation lessons, his entire table was painted blue and marked up to look like a huge naval chart. The Empress Elizabeth died when Paul was seven, followed six months later by his father, Peter III most likely murdered by his mother's supporters. His mother, Catherine, became empress. Some believed she'd hand over power to her son when he came of age in 14 years' time. Instead, he'd have to wait 34 years. As a teenager, Paul was prone to depression. He was deeply ashamed of his mother's licentious behavior and terrified of her lovers. But his tutors noted his intelligence and interest in science, art, and mystical philosophy. From his reading, he developed a particular obsession with the Knights of Malta and dreamed of one day joining their ranks. Becoming emperor was a daunting prospect for Paul. His only happiness came from his friendship with a young count, Andrei Razumovsky. Paul wrote to him, your friendship has worked a miracle. I'm no longer plagued by all my old fears. No more chimeras, away black thoughts. When Paul turned 19, his mother found him a bride, the 18-year-old Wilhelmina Luisa, princess of Hesse-Darmstadt. Paul fell in love almost immediately. After converting to Russian Orthodoxy, Wilhelmina took the name Natalia Alexeyevna. But after four years of marriage, Natalia died, giving birth to a stillborn son. Paul went almost mad with grief. His mother chose to console him by revealing letters between Natalia and Razumovsky, proving his wife had been having an affair with his best friend. Paul never recovered from this blow. The lesson he drew was never to trust anyone again. His mother quickly found Paul another German princess to marry. Six months later, he was engaged to Sofia Dorothea of Württemberg, who took the Russian name Maria Fyodorovna. Paul's second marriage was a happy one. And in the course of 25 years, she gave birth to 10 royal children. These children would carry on the Romanov dynasty for the next 150 years. Her sons included the emperors Alexander I and Nicholas I. Her grandson was Alexander II, her great-grandson Alexander III, and her great-great-grandson Nicholas II. All surviving representatives of the House of Romanov are also her descendants. The couple honeymooned in Europe, traveling incognito under the names Count and Countess Sevenik, Russian for of the North. Few of their hosts were fooled, and across Europe, Paul was welcomed with a degree of respect he'd never received at home. In Vienna, the couple went to the court theater to see a performance of Hamlet. But when the lead found out who was in the audience, it was said he refused to go on stage, declaring, I cannot play the part of a prince who seeks revenge for his murdered father with the real thing watching from the royal box. Empress Catherine never let Paul interfere in affairs of state. 
she didn't even trust him to raise his own sons, Alexander and Constantine. To keep him out of the way, she bought him the Palace of Gacina, 25 miles outside St. Petersburg. For 20 years, Paul devoted himself to creating his own miniature kingdom at Gacina. He had the buildings renovated to imitate the latest European styles and made his guards wear Prussian-style uniforms and powdered wigs. Catherine's courtiers ridiculed Paul. One wrote, You can't observe the Grand Duke's behavior without disgust. He thinks himself the King of Prussia. Every Wednesday he conducts maneuvers. The 2,000 guardsmen of the Gacina garrison never saw action, but instead became the plaything of Grand Duke Paul. Like his father, he was obsessed with soldiering and was determined to make his troops the best drilled in Russia. They rehearsed volley fire, bayonet drill, amphibious landings and assaults, and trained with artillery. By 1796, they were the most disciplined and polished troops in the Russian army. The Gacina drill went down in Russian military folklore. Before appearing on duty, each soldier was screwed into a special contraption to straighten his head and his back and keep them perfectly still. Their tight white breeches were pulled on wet and dried on the body, so there wasn't a single crease. Officers made the men practice marching with a glass of water on their head. If they spilled any water, they weren't keeping their head still enough. Even minor misdemeanors were punished with beatings. Changing the guard became an elaborate drill that lasted hours, and all soldiers marched with the famous high-stepping parade march still used by Russian guard regiments. Catherine ridiculed her son's military pretensions. She didn't like to have her son around court, but she lavished attention on her grandson, Alexander. In fact, she behaved exactly as her predecessor, Elizabeth, had done towards her own husband, Peter, which she'd so resented at the time. As soon as Alexander turned 16, Catherine arranged for him to marry a German princess and began to talk openly of bypassing her son and leaving the throne to her grandson instead. This was when Paul began to fear for his life. On the night of November 6, 1796, Paul and his wife had the same dream. An unseen force raised them up and carried them through the darkness. They woke up in terror, just as a messenger arrived from St. Petersburg. He announced that Catherine the Great was dying. Within hours, Paul was Emperor of Russia, and he was soon passing laws at a dizzying rate, as though he didn't believe he had much time. In the course of his four-and-a-half-year reign, Paul passed 7,865 acts of legislation, twice as many as Peter the Great had passed in his 43-year reign, and one-and-a-half times as many as Catherine the Great in her 34-year reign. He also found time to issue 14,207 orders concerning the army. The emperor rose at 4 a.m. and worked in his office until 9, where he received visitors and reports. Then he rode out, usually accompanied by Grand Duke Alexander, to visit some state establishment. The changing of the guard was held at 11. Then, after an hour's walking through St. Petersburg streets, Emperor returned to the parade ground to inspect the guard. He even measured the length of the soldiers' pigtails and checked the amount of powder in their hair. Officers were punished severely for the smallest faults. In just the first three days of Paul's reign, the 
emperor dismissed 16 lieutenant generals, 57 major generals, and three full generals. Over four years, 2,594 officers resigned, including 333 generals. The emperor's behavior created an atmosphere of permanent anxiety. The wife of his military adjutant remembered his victims formed an endless procession to the fortress. Often their only fault was hair that was too long or a jacket that was too short. The wearing of vests was strictly forbidden. If the emperor spotted anyone wearing a vest, the unfortunate owner was sent straight to the guardhouse. Even ladies sometimes ended up there if they saw the emperor and didn't jump out of their carriage quickly enough to make the proper curtsy. This is why the streets he used to walk along in St. Petersburg quickly became deserted. Everyone trembled before the emperor. Paul imagined himself as a perfect chivalric knight become emperor. And he had not forgotten his childhood dream of joining the Knights of Malta. When Napoleon conquered their home island in 1798, Paul offered the Knights a new home in Russia and became their Grand Master, even though he was Orthodox and it was a Catholic order. Paul became the first Russian Emperor to meet the Pope, Pius VI, even inviting him to move to Russia when Rome was also occupied by Napoleon. In Paul's eyes, Napoleon represented a world evil that had to be defeated. He allied Russia with the coalition of powers fighting against him, and sent an army under the brilliant Field Marshal Suvorov to Europe. In 1799, in northern Italy, Suvorov won three battles in just four months, and was then forced to execute a dramatic but brilliant strategic retreat across the Swiss Alps in winter. The Emperor resented Suvorov for opposing his military reforms, but even he confessed his admiration for this latest achievement, telling Suvorov, the only victory you had yet to win was over nature itself. Even there, you now have the upper hand. Paul set out to undo all his mother's reforms, which meant his next target was Russia's own nobility, who had thrived under Catherine's rule. He ended their exemption from taxes and corporal punishment, turning them into powerful enemies. Paul tried to watch everything and everyone. Stacks of unread reports began to pile up on his desk. Because of a mass purging of the civil service, there weren't enough staff left to run the offices of state. The British ambassador, Sir Charles Whitworth, who was watching the emperor carefully, wrote troubling reports to London. The emperor has gone mad. Since the moment he ascended the throne, his physical state has worsened. The emperor's behavior became more and more strange. He no longer went for walks along the embankment because he feared the strong wind might blow his head away like a soap bubble. He suffered from insomnia, so his loyal wife Maria walked with him all night so he wouldn't pester the guards with nonsensical questions. A conspiracy against him was now formed. It included Count Palin, governor of St. Petersburg, Vice-Chancellor Nikita Panin, Catherine's favorite Platon Zuboff, General Benningson, General Uvarov, and many others, perhaps as many as 300 people. Grand Duke Alexander didn't join the conspirators, but nor did he stop them. He only insisted they did not harm a hair on his father's head. The conspirators swore to it. They wanted Paul to abdicate and retire to Mikolovsky Castle, or as a last resort, they would lock him up. Mikhailovsky Castle was Paul's newest palace, his fantasy made real. The designs had taken years, but their realization had had to wait until Catherine the Great's death. As soon as Paul was emperor, construction began and was finished in just three and a half years. Paul ordered the court to move here while the interiors were still unfinished. Its dark stairways and eerie corridors 
created a strange, unsettling atmosphere. But Paul felt at home. The Emperor's behavior was becoming even more unpredictable. He sat for hours in deep thought. He began to suspect his wife and sons of plotting against him. He wrote a secret letter and hid it in a chest with a note reading, to be opened by our descendant 100 years after my death. It was known that it concerned the fate of the dynasty and that Paul had written it after speaking with a prisoner from the Peter and Paul fortress named Abel. Abel was a monk, born Vasily Vasiliev in 1757, who took his monastic vows at the island monastery of Valam. He was later said to have gained the gift of prophecy and wrote many of his visions down in a book. It's claimed he accurately predicted many events, some of which took place during his lifetime, such as the death of Catherine the Great, the death of Paul, Napoleon's invasion of Russia, the Decembrist revolt, as well as more distant events, including the First World War, the Russian Revolution, the murder of the last Tsar, civil war, repression, and war with Hitler. Abel had been locked up for prophesying the death of the last Empress, but he was summoned from his prison cell to speak with Paul. When asked what future he saw for the Emperor, Abel replied, your reign will be short. You will be strangled in your bedchamber by scoundrels who even now you hold in your warm embrace. He even named the day, March 11th. On the evening of the 11th, Paul dined with his family. At one point, he looked into a mirror and joked, what a funny mirror. I can see myself in it with a broken neck. At that moment, the conspirators were holding their final meeting at Count Palin's house. When someone asked what they should do if the emperor resisted, Palin answered, omelets are not made without breaking eggs. After dinner, the emperor suddenly said, what will be, will be, and went to his bedchamber. He checked the doors and windows and wondered why the crows in the summer garden were making such a fuss. His assassins were passing through the summer garden on their way to the palace. When they arrived, the guards let them in. Paul heard heavy footsteps in the corridor and knew they'd come for him. The conspirators included ex-army officers, many of whom were drunk. They burst into the emperor's bedroom and found him hiding behind a screen. They tried to make him sign his abdication, but he refused. Then Platon Zubov struck him on the temple with a golden snuff box, like a pair of brass knuckle dusters. The emperor fell to the ground. Paul fought bravely, one against a dozen. They beat him senseless, and then throttled him with his own scarf. The Russian people were told Emperor Paul I had died from an apoplectic stroke. Indeed, insiders joked, the stroke of a snuff box to the head. <laughs> French artist Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun witnessed the reaction to the emperor's death. The city went wild with delight. People were singing, dancing and kissing in the streets people I knew would run up to my carriage, shake my hand and exclaim, now we are free. Many households even hung out lights. The death of this unhappy emperor caused universal joy.
within hours of Paul's death, his son, the new emperor Alexander, issued a declaration promising to rule in the spirit of his grandmother, Catherine the Great. But he did not share in the general sense of jubilation. He was sickened by the events of the previous night. He had only wanted what was best for Russia, but his good intentions had paved the way to hell, his own personal hell, that would remain with him for the rest of his life. Chapter two, Alexander I Pavlovich. It was Catherine the Great who chose the name Alexander for Paul's first son. Officially, he was named in honor of the Russian hero Alexander Nevsky. In reality, after the great conqueror Alexander the Great. The Empress showered all the motherly affection she had denied to her son Paul on this boy, her first grandson. Catherine wrote about the little prince with pride. She described a boy who was courteous, cheerful and obedient and who made an effort to be liked. Everyone expected great things from Alexander. He was watched all the time. It was like being always on stage, and in time, he developed a mask for every occasion. The politician Baron Korf noted, the emperor could penetrate minds and see to the bottom of people's souls without ever revealing his own thoughts and feelings. Alexander knew his grandmother wanted to leave the throne to him instead of his father, but he did not relish the prospect. The only person he trusted was his Swiss tutor, Frederick Le Harp. A Republican and an idealist, Le Harp was appointed by Catherine to instill her own enlightened humanist values in the young prince. Alexander was not yet 15 when the Empress arranged for him to meet two sisters. Princesses of Baden, 13-year-old Louise and 11-year-old Dorothea. Alexander was to choose one of them to marry. He chose the elder, Louise, who converted to orthodoxy and took the name Elizabeth. They were married the following year. Courtiers nicknamed the newlyweds Cupid and Psyche. Alexander's charming, beautiful bride inspired many artists and poets. Theodore Glinka wrote of her, Gentle queen, glory of the czars, your divine face is worthy of altars. Elizabeth would go on to become renowned as a Russian patriot. During the Napoleonic Wars, she founded a society to support the sick and wounded and pay for their hospital treatment. She founded orphanages and schools for the children of officers killed in the war, as well as other charitable institutions. Elizabeth was considered the great beauty of her age. Guards officers formed clubs inspired by their love for her. For all of Russian society, she became an emblem of love, beauty and virtue. But when Elizabeth first arrived at the Russian court during the reign of Alexander's father, Paul, she found it a place of anxiety and gloominess. The emperor constantly found fault with everyone, even Elizabeth. And as the young couple grew up, their different temperaments became more obvious. Alexander was passionate, Elizabeth cool. They drifted apart and in time took other lovers. In the sixth year of marriage, Elizabeth gave birth to a daughter, Maria, but she died within the year. With each passing year, Alexander realized he didn't want to become emperor. He dreamt of leaving everything behind and going to live with Elizabeth by the River Rhine in romantic seclusion. In a letter to a trusted friend, 
he confessed, I realized that I wasn't born for the title I bear now, and even less for the one destined for me. I've sworn to myself to refuse it in one way or another. The certainties of the Gachina parade ground became almost a place of psychological relief. During training, a cannon went off next to Alexander, leaving him deaf in his left ear. His deafness led to a paranoid fear that people were always laughing at him behind his back. On one occasion, he passed three officers sharing a joke and laughing amongst themselves. He ordered one of them to his office. As the officer arrived, Alexander was examining himself in the mirror. What's funny about me? he asked. Why did you laugh at me? It was impossible to persuade the Grand Duke that they'd been laughing at something else. When Alexander became emperor, his first acts were to revoke all the unpopular decrees of his father, Paul. He closed the secret chancellery allowed nobles to travel abroad once more and restored their other rights and privileges. Everyone had their own plan to reform the empire in the name of progress and enlightenment. So Alexander assembled a group of friends and advisors, all young liberals like himself, educated in the European style, to decide the way forward. Within two years, Alexander's Privy Committee had created new government ministries to replace the old collegia and put in place progressive education reforms. Universities were open to everyone, censorship laws were relaxed, and five new universities were founded. A first step was taken towards reforming Russia's serf laws. A new decree allowed serfs to buy their freedom if their owners agreed. They were to form a new class of free plowmen. Reforms moved slowly and faced significant opposition. Alexander was dismayed. Everyone seemed to think only about their own interests. No one seemed to share his concern for the common good. Then he found a man who seemed to understand and share his dream for Russia perfectly. Extraordinarily intelligent and hardworking, his name was Mikhail Speransky. He became first the secretary to the Privy Committee and later the emperor's right-hand man. The emperor himself took on responsibility for foreign policy. The great threat remained Napoleon Bonaparte, who had now crowned himself emperor of the French. He threatened to overthrow the established order of Europe, and war loomed once more. In 1805, at Austerlitz, in today's Czech Republic, they met in the Battle of the Three Emperors, Alexander of Russia and Francis II of Austria, against Napoleon. The old veteran General Kutuzov commanded the Russian army, but Alexander, jealous of Napoleon's martial glory, took charge himself. Alexander saw his army crushed and routed and was forced to flee to save his own life. Those close to him saw the emperor trembling and weeping. A Cossack brought him some wine. He eventually calmed down and fell asleep on a bed of straw inside a shed. After the disaster at Austerlitz, Alexander never again interfered in military strategy. He kept to his own forte diplomacy. Even his great adversary Napoleon recognized his charm. The Russian emperor is intelligent, pleasant and well-educated, but he cannot be trusted. He is insincere. He is a subtle deceiver, a devious fellow. 
Two more years of war followed. Then, in 1807, the two emperors agreed to meet to negotiate peace. Their armies were separated by the river Niemann, so they met on a specially constructed raft in the middle of the river near the town of Tilsit. Alexander and Napoleon sat under a grand canopy, one on one, without generals or attendants, and talked for two hours. At Tilsit, they signed a peace treaty, which committed Russia to join Napoleon's continental blockade against Britain. It caused Russian exports to fall by 20%, with serious consequences for the economy. French exports fell by a similar amount. But soon, Russia was preparing for another war against France. Alexander was in no doubt that further conflict was unavoidable. In anticipation, Alexander almost doubled spending on the army, from 63.4 million rubles to 118.5 million. On June 12, 1812, Napoleon's Grand Armée of 450,000 men began to cross the river Niemann. Alexander had no more than 200,000 men with which to face him. On the first day of the war, Alexander went to Moscow to address his people from the ancient capital. During an open-air service, he was profoundly moved when a peasant shouted out to him, Lead us, dear father. We will die, all of us. But we will win. The next day, Alexander issued an imperial decree, stating, I will not lay down my arms while a single enemy soldier remains in my realm. Hot-headed generals like Bagration wanted to meet Napoleon in one great decisive battle. But Alexander instead approved a policy of strategic retreat put forward by Barclay de Tolly. Napoleon was forced to advance further and further into Russia, hoping to trap the Russian army and inflict a crushing defeat that would force Alexander to give in. As the people of St. Petersburg prepared to flee, fearing Napoleon would soon reach the capital, Alexander was haunted by visions of his murdered father. He was certain he was to blame for his father's death, and the invasion was God's punishment for his unforgivable sin. He shared his fears with his close friend, Prince Galitzin. Galitzin turned to the Bible for guidance. He let a page fall open at random. It was a verse from Psalm 91. My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Alexander, who'd never shown much interest in religion before, was greatly affected. He wrote to a friend, describing his revelation. I devoured the Bible, finding its words poured into me anew, bringing a peace to my heart that I'd never known before. The emperor stepped aside from military affairs and handed supreme command to the 67-year-old Kutuzov. Kutuzov, a veteran of four wars, decided it was time to fight the great battle everyone had been waiting for, near a village called Borodino, 70 miles from Moscow. When news arrived of the outcome, it was clear that both sides had suffered heavy losses, but that Napoleon had not been stopped. Alexander then received news that Kutuzov intended to abandon Moscow. The emperor's nerves were close to breaking. He paced around his office for an entire night. When he emerged in the morning, he was berated by his brother Constantine, while his mother, the dowager empress, became hysterical. Only his wife noticed the emperor had turned half gray overnight. On September 2nd, Napoleon entered the Kremlin and settled in Alexander's state apartments. The very same day, Moscow began to burn from fires lit across the city. Four days later, Napoleon sent his first letter to Alexander 
offering to negotiate a peace. There was no answer. Napoleon sent two more letters, but Alexander remained silent. The emperor shared his thoughts in letters to his beloved sister, Catherine. I'd rather cease to exist than make peace with that monster who brings misery to all. I trust in God for the incredible spirit of my people and for the resoluteness with which I decided not to bow down beneath the yoke. In October, Napoleon's army began its long retreat from Moscow. Harassed by Cossacks and decimated by the cold, it became one of the great catastrophes of military history. In November, just a few thousand frozen, hungry, and demoralized soldiers recrossed the Niemen River, the pitiful remnants of Napoleon's army. Russia's first patriotic war was over. Russian dead totaled 200,000 soldiers. The civilian death toll was even higher. But Alexander had no intention of ending the war. The Russian army went on the offensive, determined to defeat Napoleon once and for all. Alexander I and his allies fought their way across Europe, dethroning the upstart monarchs created by Napoleon and restoring the old order. On March 19, 1814, Alexander entered Paris at the head of the Allied troops. All Europe stood in awe of him. In London, he was made godparent to a future queen of Great Britain, named after him, Alexandrina Victoria. In Berlin, the main square was named Alexanderplatz in his honor. In Paris, the Russian emperor made a great impression with his talk of constitutions and liberty. He was adored by the public, who treated him like a modern celebrity, struggling to get a glimpse of him. This was his favorite role, the bel roi, the great sovereign. From Paris, he went to Vienna, where a congress was held to decide the future of Europe. Russian emperor entered an arena populated by the shrewdest minds and most cunning diplomats of the age. But he played his part masterfully, never revealing his true feelings or intentions. People came to call him the mysterious Russian Sphinx. The Congress of Vienna awarded Alexander yet more titles and more land. He was now ruler of all the Russias, king of Poland, Grand Duke of Finland, 55 titles in total. And for his victory over Napoleon, he was solemnly named the Blessed. When Alexander returned to Russia, he was not the same hot-headed, handsome boy that had dreamt of liberty and the common good. Not yet 40, he had already been hailed as the savior of Europe. Appearances were always important to Alexander. Everything had to be symmetrical, faultless, precise. His uniforms were always immaculate and fitted him exactly. No one had ever seen the emperor dressed casually, even at home. But now he became a true pedant. Documents had to be the exact same size and placed on his desk in neat piles. The furniture was arranged according to a plan and nobody was permitted to move a chair or vase. If only it were possible to impose the same order on Russia. It was not the enlightened reformer Speransky who was now Alexander's closest companion, but the old soldier Count Alexei Arakcheyev, an artillery expert who had served the emperor's father Akachina. His closeness to the emperor aroused considerable resentment amongst other courtiers who, behind his back, called him a brute and a gorilla. Incredible stories were told about the Count. It was said he got so furious that he tore soldiers' moustaches off and once even bit a soldier's ear off. But he was honest, able, and devoted to the Emperor. He had Alexander's absolute trust. Alexander put Arakcheyev in charge of his new project inspired by the ideas of a Welsh utopian socialist, Robert Owen. 
Alexander wanted to create military settlements where soldiers lived with their families and combined their military service with farming. Arakcheyev tried to talk Alexander out of the idea. He even begged him on bended knee, but he had received an order and would carry it out with all his ability. The emperor believed everyone would benefit from the settlements. Soldiers could live with their families. The army would feed itself. There would be good order everywhere. But conditions in the settlements instead quickly led to rioting. Life in the settlements was strictly regulated, down to the tiniest detail. Everything was identical, from houses to pots and pans. Every day was ordered around a strict timetable. Children were enlisted in the army at the age of seven, and from then on came under the authority of their officers, not their parents. Opposition and plots against him now caused Alexander to radically change his views. He turned his back on his former ideals of tolerance and liberalism. Instead, censorship was tightened. So-called free thinkers were placed under surveillance or sent into exile. In reports on secret societies, he kept seeing the same familiar names. Trubetskoy, Muravyov brothers, Balkonsky, Pestel. But he stayed his hand. I cannot judge them too severely, he said. I once shared their ideals. Alexander began to increasingly question his own purpose. In a letter to the French diplomat, Auguste de choiseul gouffier he wrote, one needs to stand in my shoes to know what I feel. When I reflect that I will have to answer to God for the life of each one of my soldiers. No, the throne is not my calling. If I could with honor change the circumstances of my life, I'd do it with pleasure. I confess that sometimes I feel like beating my head against the wall. His father's murder, which had brought him to power, the deaths of thousands of Russian soldiers, the pursuit of glory that now seemed worthless. In his Bible, he underlined the words, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. The love of his youth, Empress Elizabeth, came to his rescue. For many years, they'd lived separately as strangers. But now, he recognized in her a loyal friend with whom he could talk about anything. When Elizabeth was diagnosed with tuberculosis, Alexander decided they must leave St. Petersburg and its damp climate as soon as possible. He wrote to his old friend, Prince Vakonsky, soon we'll move to Crimea and live as private subjects. I've served 25 years. After that, soldiers are entitled to retire. They did not go to Crimea, but to the southern city of Taganrog instead. The emperor had visited it once and liked it. Hurried preparations were made for the arrival of the royal couple. Alexander left first to prepare everything for his wife's arrival. He moved into a single-storied stone mansion on Grachevskia Street. He swept the garden paths himself. He helped to hang engravings on the wall and moved the furniture into place. And when Elizabeth arrived, they enjoyed a quiet, peaceful life. They went for walks, greeting those they knew. They read their favorite books to each other. They prayed together. Alexander seemed rejuvenated, as if he had been given a second chance at life. But all the while, he remained emperor. 
Alexander's strange, carefree behavior would come at a price. It was soon to become the pretext for a tragic and bloody revolt. But Alexander did not live to see it. His southern idyll lasted only two months. On November the 19th, after a short illness, he died. The Empress Elizabeth died six months later. The Emperor's sudden death threw many into confusion. There were rumors that Alexander had faked his death and gone into hiding somewhere. Ten years later, reports emerged of a mysterious old man named Fyodor Kuzmich, who lived in a village near Tomsk in Siberia. He was well-educated, spoke several foreign languages, and was extremely pious. He refused ever to discuss his earlier life. The old man was tall, broad-shouldered, and like Alexander, deaf in one ear. Kuzmich died in 1864 and was buried in the grounds of the Tomsk Monastery. His headstone reads, this is the grave of the great blessed elder, Fyodor Kuzmich. The rumors that Kuzmich was in fact Alexander remain to this day neither proved nor disproved. Two years before his death, Alexander had talked to his younger brother, Grand Duke Nicholas, of his intention to abdicate in his favor. Nicholas's wife wrote in her diary, speaking to us about his abdication, the emperor said, how I will rejoice when I see you driving past me. I'll mingle in the crowd, and with the rest of them, shout, hurrah. December 14th, 1825. The revolt was over, but the emperor's eldest son, Grand Duke Alexander, was still trembling with fear. The boy knew his father had gone out to do his duty and might have been killed for it. Then he heard his father's voice calling him to come outside. Loyal troops were formed up in the courtyard. Just an hour earlier, they had refused the rebels' entry to the palace. The emperor took his son in his arms and addressed the men. I don't need protection, but I entrust him to you, and handed Alexander over to them. The soldiers cheered with tears in their eyes. The young prince was carried aloft in their arms. Nobody suspected that one day, this future emperor would face far greater dangers of his own. Nicholas was a huge baby, the size of a three-month-old, it was said. His grandmother, Catherine the Great, wrote in admiration, I've never seen such a cavalier. 
If he continues to grow, this colossus will dwarf his brothers. Chapter 1. Nicholas I Pavlovich. When Nicholas was five, his father, the Emperor Paul, was brutally murdered by conspirators. The children remembered it well. The youngest brother, Michael, was playing on his own. He built a train of tiny carriages and used it to carry a toy soldier to a potted plant, then buried him in the earth. When asked what he was doing, he answered, I'm burying my father. After Paul's death in 1801, his eldest son, the 24-year-old Alexander, became emperor. The second brother, Constantine, became the new heir to the throne. As the third brother, Nicholas wasn't expected to inherit the throne. He grew up under the strict care of his mother, Maria, the dowager empress. At the age of 17, Nicholas and his younger brother, Michael, were allowed to travel abroad. Years later, he recalled, that's when we started to live, stepping from childhood into the light of life. It was in Berlin that I saw, for the first time, the girl I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. The 16-year-old Princess Charlotte of Prussia, daughter of the king, was an ideal match for the Grand Duke. They were married two years later, and Charlotte took the Russian name Alexandra Fyodorovna. Grand Duke Nicholas was later appointed Chief Inspector of the Corps of Engineers and Commander of the Guards Engineer Battalion. Every day he rose early for prayer and morning exercise, performing complex bayonet drill with a musket. The rest of the day was spent writing orders and reports and carrying out inspections. Nicholas's elder brother, Emperor Alexander I, often hinted that he planned to leave the throne to Nicholas, since their middle brother, Constantine, had no interest in becoming emperor. And so, in 1823, Alexander signed a secret will, making Nicholas his heir. Only four people knew of its existence. Nicholas was not one of them. On November 19, 1825, Alexander died suddenly in the southern city of Taganrog. Eight days later, the news reached St. Petersburg. Nicholas swore allegiance to his older brother, Constantine, the presumed heir, who was in Warsaw. Then, Alexander's secret will was proclaimed, and two weeks later, Constantine's renunciation of the throne arrived from Poland. It was a unique case in world history. Instead of quarreling for the throne, two Romanov brothers were insisting it belonged to the other. Cad Langeron later paid them a subtle French compliment. The Romanovs are so noble, they do not ascend, but descend to the throne. But the resulting confusion was dangerous and encouraged a secret radical society, the Decembrists, to make their move. The Decembrists were made up of liberal-minded guards officers and nobles who wished to reform the monarchy and free Russia's serfs. Its members included many high-ranking aristocrats. Members of its northern society, led by Nikita Muravyev, favored a constitutional monarchy, while members of the southern society, under Pavel Pestel, wanted to abolish the monarch and redistribute the land. They planned to carry out a military coup d'etat. The more radical conspirators, Ryelyev and Pestel, talked of killing the entire Romanov family including the princesses living abroad and their children, so no one could ever lay claim to the Russian throne again. The troops were due to swear their oaths of loyalty to the new emperor on December 14th. The evening before, Nicholas visited Mikhailovsky Castle, 
where his father had been murdered. When he returned, he asked his wife to die with honor, if need be. At 11.20, Nicholas was told the Moscow Guards Regiment had refused to swear the oath and had marched to Senate Square. At 11.30, the Emperor went to the square with the loyal palace guards. At 12.20, General Miloradovich tried to talk to the rebel troops, but was shot dead by a Decembrist. At 1 p.m., 900 rebel guardsmen approached the Winter Palace. 1.20 p.m., Nicholas sent a bishop to reason with the soldiers, but nobody listened to him. By 2 p.m., there were 3,000 rebel troops in the square. Loyal troops were arriving all the time, but Nicholas continued to delay. At 10 past four, cannon opened fire on the rebels. The young Empress Alexandra could see the Senate Square filled with people. At the sound of the first volley, she wrote, I fell to my knees in a small study and prayed like never before. The strain of that day affected Alexandra for the rest of her life. Her health suffered. Already thin, she lost more weight and became frequently ill. The emperor ordered the first blast of grape shot to be fired over the heads of the rebel soldiers. But the next volley was fired straight into the crowd. When the smoke cleared, the death toll stood at one general, 18 officers, 282 soldiers, and 1,170 civilians, including 79 women and 150 children, a total of 1,271 dead. Six hundred and seventy-nine people were investigated following the Decembrist revolt, but most turned out to have no connection to the secret societies that had organized the coup. Of those finally put on trial, 112 lost their titles and all of their property rights. 99 were exiled to Siberia, 36 of those to labor camps, 9 officers were demoted to the ranks, 36 were sentenced to death. 31 by beheading, and five by quartering. Emperor Nicholas himself mitigated many of the sentences, and in the end, only five Decembrists were executed. They included ringleaders such as Pestel and the poet Rieliev, and the man who'd shot General Mir Loradovich. Quartering was commuted to hanging. The emperor himself paid an allowance to the widows of the executed men. Their families continued to receive payments from the office of the general staff for 20 years, while the children were put through school at public expense. Nicholas ordered the Decembrist grievances to be looked at by a special committee. He invited Count Kiselyov, a Decembrist sympathizer and opponent of serfdom, to look into its abolition. While receiving a delegation of nobles from Smolensk, the emperor told them plainly, I cannot understand how a person became a thing. I cannot explain it other than through guile and deceit on one side and ignorance on the other. During Nicholas's reign, new restrictions were imposed on the owners of serfs. Landowners could no longer sentence serfs to hard labor or sell them off without land. Serfs were granted more freedom of movement and the right to conduct their own business. The percentage of Russians living as privately owned serfs fell from 57% to 35%. The number of schools for peasants rose from 60 to 2,550. 
Nicholas was trained as an engineer and fascinated by new inventions. In 1835, he was seduced by a project many thought was crazy. At that time, there were only three railroads in the world, two in England and one in America. Nicholas studied the schemes on offer carefully and authorized construction of an experimental railroad between St. Petersburg and his palace at Zaskiesello. Four years later, ignoring the objections of ministers, he ordered another line built, connecting St. Petersburg and Moscow. At the time, it was the longest railroad in the world, at 649.7 kilometers. Its construction cost 67 million rubles, one third of the empire's annual budget. All 34 stations and both terminals were designed by one architect, Konstantin Ton, who was also responsible for the Grand Kremlin Palace. The rails were 1,524 millimeters apart, 89 millimeters wider than in Europe. It was believed the emperor insisted on this difference so an invading army couldn't use its own rolling stock on Russian railways. 100 years later, during World War II, those 89 millimeters would prove crucial in slowing down the advance and resupply of German troops during the battle for Moscow. During Nicholas's reign, 700 miles of rail track were laid across Russia. It was not much, but Russia's first railways did help to stimulate Russian industrial output, which grew 30-fold in just three decades. Russia's first hardened roads were built, connecting Moscow and St. Petersburg, Moscow and Irkutsk, and Moscow and Warsaw. These developments, overseen by Russia's engineer emperor, began a much needed modernization of the country's transport network. The emperor began his working day at 7 a.m. Around 11, he'd take a walk along the palace embankment without guards, greeting those he knew. He then returned to work until around 8 p.m., when he would go out to the theater or perhaps a ball. He returned home at midnight and worked until 3 a.m. By today's standards, his personal security was non-existent. No one saw the need. The emperor didn't eat much, and when he did, preferred simple food. He loved veal cutlets with mashed potato, but often had just a slice of black bread or a salted cucumber for dinner. On the road, his meals were even simpler, porridge and some cabbage soup, which he'd eat from the same bowl. He drank mineral water from Salzburg, and very rarely, wines from Bordeaux. He never smoked. They said that those of a nervous disposition found it difficult to meet the emperor's gaze, while ladies were known to faint in his presence, not from fear, but from adoration. Nicholas, six foot two, broad-shouldered and well-built, was considered one of the most handsome men in Europe. It was rumored at court that Nicholas wore padding underneath his uniform to look more imposing, but his private doctor said this was not true. The emperor simply had a very broad chest. In public, he did not relax for an instant. His appearance was immaculate at all times. It's no surprise that Nicholas I became the role model for all future Romanovs. The emperor brought a sense of calm and stability to Russia in an uncertain age. Contemporary newspapers depicted France as an exploding bottle of champagne, while Russia was a bottle of vodka without a bubble in sight. It was a reference to the explosive revolutions sweeping across Europe in the 1840s. Only Britain, the Netherlands and Russia escaped unrest. Nicholas's 30-year reign was the most stable period in the history of Tsarist Russia. Nicholas devoted himself to matters of state. No important document crossed his desk without some comment from him. His own office, 
the imperial chancellery became the hub of government. The first section of the chancellery was responsible for preparing imperial decrees and monitoring their implementation. The second section worked on the codification of Russia's laws into a single text. The third section was in charge of police surveillance, censorship, tracing counterfeiters and investigating serf complaints against landowners. The fourth section, or the office of the Empress Maria, worked on charitable projects, including shelters, hospitals and women's education. The fifth section worked on reforms of the serf system. The notorious third section of the Imperial Chancellery effectively served as the Tsar's secret police. Its mission was to gauge the political mood for him and to expose any conspiracies against the regime. It had a permanent staff, however, of just 36. It was led by a hero of the Napoleonic Wars and close friend of the Emperor, Count Alexander von Benkendorf. He also headed the Special Corps of Gendarmes, who served as a uniformed security police with a strength of 4,000. The prestige and authority of the corps was very high. It's no coincidence that a gendarme appears in the famous final scene of Gogol's play, The Government Inspector. Gogol's satire only avoided being banned thanks to the emperor's personal intervention. Though remembered as a great reactionary, Nicholas saw no harm in such an amusing play. One of Nicholas's first acts after his coronation was to end the exile of the great Russian poet Alexander Pushkin. The emperor even exempted Pushkin from the normal channels of censorship, promising to vet his works personally. Pushkin dedicated nine poems to Nicholas, while the emperor intervened on a number of occasions to get Pushkin out of trouble, even paying off his debts worth the equivalent of several million dollars. In 1837, another great Russian poet, Mikhail Lyamantov, was transferred from his Guard Hussars regiment to a unit fighting in the far south in Russia's endless Caucasian war. The conflict had begun 20 years earlier, in 1817, when the Russian army invaded the northern Caucasus during the reign of Alexander I. The war ebbed and flowed until reaching a new crescendo in the 1830s when Imam Shamil led Chechen and Dagestani warriors in a jihad against the Russian invader. The fighting dragged on for another 30 years until Russia was finally able to impose its rule on the Northern Caucasus. By the 1850s, a European coalition was forming against Russia, alarmed by the expansionist foreign policy of the Russian Empire. Under Nicholas, Russia had won wars against both the Persian and Ottoman empires, and its growing influence in the Eastern Mediterranean and Central Asia was seen as a threat to British and French imperial interests. In 1853, fighting broke out around the Black Sea, leading to what became known as the Crimean War. Russian troops clashed with Turkish troops in the Balkans and Caucasus, while the Black Sea fleet annihilated a Turkish squadron at the Battle of Sinop. Days later, British and French warships appeared in the Black Sea. By 1854, Russia was at war with Britain, France, Turkey and Sardinia. Austria and Prussia remained neutral. Nicholas was profoundly depressed that Russia was not only isolated, but at war with its former allies. The fighting raged on many fronts, from Crimea and the Caucasus in the south to the White Sea in the north. Here, a British naval expedition was repulsed, but in the Baltic, the British naval blockade crippled Russian trade. In the Caucasus, Russian troops were victorious, but in Crimea, the main theater of war, a disaster unfolded. Russian forces besieged at Sevastopol faced a powerful enemy. Steam-driven warships made up 30% of the Russian fleet, but 70% of the Allied fleet. 
Admiral Nakimov was forced to sink his own ships in the entrance to Sevastopol Harbor. It was the only way to keep out the more powerful British and French warships. More than 127,000 Russians were killed in the siege of Sevastopol. The total death toll of the Russian army was about 143,000. The Crimean War was a catastrophe for Russia. Russian soldiers and sailors fought with incredible bravery. But in the end, the industrialized might of France and Britain proved too strong. In September 1855, Sevastopol fell, and the Black Sea Fleet was no more. Nicholas was crushed. He couldn't sleep and wore himself out with work. Doctors told him he needed rest, but he didn't listen. In a private conversation, the Emperor said, if it was up to me, I would never have chosen this position for myself. But it's my watch. I have my orders and must fulfill them as best I can. At the end of January, the Emperor caught a chill. His doctor forbade him from going out in the cold, but Nicholas insisted on attending a parade for troops leaving for the front. He told his doctor, You've done your duty. Now let me do mine. It was soon evident the emperor had contracted pneumonia. On February 17th, his lungs began to give up. The emperor was fully conscious and knew he had hours to live. He said his prayers and then bid farewell to his family. When told a courier had arrived from Crimea with urgent news, he pointed to his son and said, this is not for me, this is for him. Then he said to Prince Alexander, I hand over command, though I do not leave things in the state I would have wished. On February 18th, 1855, a banner of mourning rose above the Winter Palace. Nicholas I was dead. His successor was his 37-year-old son, Alexander, a man destined to achieve what his great-grandmother, Catherine the Great, his uncle, Alexander I, and his father, Nicholas, could not. Alexander II would go down in history as the Liberator. Chapter 2, Alexander II Nikolaevich. His father used to say, I want to bring my son up as a man first and then an emperor. The prince's tutors, such as the romantic poet Vasily Zhukovsky, were all men with liberal views. When Alexander was 13, his father interrupted a lesson to speak to him about the Decembrist revolt. What would you do if you were me? The emperor asked. I'd forgive them, Alexander said. After finishing his studies, the prince traveled across Russia, covering 30,000 kilometers and visiting 30 provinces. He was the first Romanov to cross the border of Europe and Asia and to visit Siberia. In Tobolsk, the prince met the exiled Decembrists and did what he could to make their life easier. In Vyatka, he met another exile, Alexander Herzen. The two young men became friends and Alexander helped hasten the young writer's eventual return to Moscow. Herzen later praised the reforming emperor Alexander II did many things, a great many things. His name stands above that of all his predecessors. He fought for the rights of man. Neither the Russian people nor history will forget that. In 1852, Herzen moved to London, from where he agitated for sweeping social change in his homeland. 
First and foremost, he demanded the abolition of serfdom. When he was still a young prince, Alexander's father had often accused him of listening more to his heart than to his mind. He certainly had many unregal qualities. He was carefree, gentle, and sensitive. What's more, the gallant, handsome young prince, heir to the Russian throne, was constantly falling in love with palace chambermaids. In 1838, the 20-year-old Alexander was sent to Europe by his parents to find an eligible young princess to marry. In Darmstadt, he became devoted to a shy and pretty 14-year-old, Princess Maximiliana Wilhelmina Maria of Hesse. Later, in London, Alexander was presented to the newly crowned Queen Victoria, ruler of the British Empire. They met at Windsor Castle on her 20th birthday. In her diary, Victoria described Alexander as a dear, delightful man with a sweet smile and a manly figure. They danced together until the small hours of the morning. He is so very strong, she wrote, that in running around, you must follow quickly and after that, you are whisked around, which is very pleasant. I have never enjoyed myself more. Alexander was infatuated and prepared to renounce the Russian throne to become the British Prince Consort. His courtiers were forced to intervene, talking sense into the young prince and reminding him of his duty to Russia, not to mention the young Princess of Hesse. That union was approved by all, so the couple were married in St. Petersburg in 1841. His new wife took the Russian name Maria Alexandrovna. For the first few years, Alexander was wildly in love with his young wife and spoiled her continuously. He even had an apple tree brought into the dining room so Maria could pick its fruit herself as she liked. But it did not last long. They spent less and less time together. And when they met, they discussed only their health, their children, and the weather. They appeared together in public for official functions and visits, then went to separate bedrooms in the evening. The Empress's health suffered from St. Petersburg's cold, wet climate, as well as from frequent childbirth. By 36, she'd had six children and was a shadow of her former self. The emperor had many short-lived affairs, with ladies-in-waiting, chambermaids, even older students from the nearby Smolny Institute of Noble Maidens. But Alexander was forgiven everything, because everyone loved him. The country was alive with expectation. He was Russia's great hope. When Alexander became emperor, he already had many years' experience of the workings of state and got to work immediately. His first success was to end the Crimean War, signing a peace treaty in Paris which kept Russian losses to a minimum. Then he turned his attention to what was, for Russia, the great issue of the age, the serfs. In one of his first addresses to the Russian nobility, the emperor announced, the existing system of owning souls cannot remain unchanged. It is better to abolish serfdom from above than to wait for it to abolish itself from below. Until now, Russia's rulers hadn't dared to interfere with serfdom for fear of a revolt by the nobles. But for Alexander, there was no longer any alternative. The case for reform, moral, economic and political, was irresistible. After seven years of negotiation, on February 19, 1861, the Emperor issued a manifesto freeing Russia's serfs. 
The Act of Emancipation freed all serfs in private ownership and gave them the right to buy the land they worked on from the landowner. The state helped peasants pay for the land with subsidies and long-term loans. Peasants were to pay 20% of its value and the state 80%. However, in some cases, only 30% of the land they previously worked was eligible for purchase and it was sold at inflated prices. State loans also trapped many peasants in debt for decades. Following the emancipation of the serfs, the 100 million peasants in Russia, who made up 71% of the population, owned half as much land as the 1.7 million nobles, who made up just 1.5% of the population. A wave of liberal reforms followed. In 1864, each district and province was granted its own elected assembly, known as Zemstva, with authority over local education, roads, medical services, and social welfare. Education reform increased the number of state secondary schools and universities, with more schools for the poor, the first general education courses for women, and the granting of special status and greater autonomy for universities. Reform of the courts introduced greater equality for all classes before the law, as well as public trials, counsel for defense and prosecution, and juries. In the army, universal conscription replaced the old quota system, and modern weapons such as rifles were introduced. They were the most progressive and liberal reforms in Russia's history. When an old courtier warned that now the serfs were free, the people would demand a constitution, Alexander replied, well, if Russia clearly desires it and is ready for it, I too am ready. Alexander set strict deadlines for his ministers and advisers, which he kept to himself despite the huge piles of documents that arrived on his desk every day. His goal was to finish all the work begun by his father, which meant turning next to the war in the Caucasus. The long Caucasian war finally came to an end in 1864, following the Russian conquest of Chechnya, Dagestan, Circassia, and Abkhazia. In the next decade, Russia also took control of the Emirate of Bukhara and Khanate of Kiva, pushing south as far as the town of Kushka, which remained the empire's most southerly point until the collapse of the Soviet Union. The only territory lost in this period was Alaska, 1.5 million square kilometers of barren, almost uninhabited land which in 1867 was sold to the United States for $7.2 million, worth around $108 million today. At the time, the deal was considered very profitable. Typically, Alexander worked with short breaks from 9 a.m. until 6 in the evening, when he had dinner. He spent his evenings with his family or at official functions, his favorite sport was hunting. He loved long hunting expeditions for bear, elk, and bison. But soon it was Alexander who was being hunted through the very streets of the Russian capital. Alexander was the last ruler in Russian history who would be allowed to simply walk the city streets without guards. Almost every day in St. Petersburg's summer garden, the regulars pretended not to recognize the tall gentleman in military uniform, whose portrait hung in every government office in the empire. Alexander was now 48 and had lost count of the number of affairs he'd had. At first, his relationship with 19-year-old Catherine Dolgorukova, a student from the Smolny Institute for Young Maidens, seemed like many of the others. But after just a few meetings, 
the emperor was in love. Many years later, Catherine remembered how Alexander always behaved so tenderly towards her, treating her as though she were a sacred object. We saw each other every day, she wrote, crazy with the joy of loving and understanding each other so completely. He swore to me that he would always be faithful to me and that his only dream was to marry me if he ever became free. On April 4th, 1866, after meeting with Catherine, Alexander was leaving the summer garden when an assassin stepped out. The emperor, of course, knew his enemies might try to overthrow or even murder him. An old fortune teller had once told him that there would be seven attempts on his life. Alexander always remembered it. The first attempt was made by a 26-year-old lone assassin named Dmitri Karakosov, an impoverished nobleman and former student. He believed the emperor's death would inspire the people to rise up in revolution. He was thwarted by a farmer standing next to him named Komisarov, who grabbed his hand at the last moment and forced him to fire high. Karakozov was arrested. He said he tried to kill the Tsar because his reforms had cheated the people by giving them too little land. The entire country was shocked. In 1863, the great historian Sergei Solovyov described the situation Russia faced. Extremes are easy. It was easy to tighten the screws in Nicholas's time. It was easy to unscrew them in Alexander's time. But it's exceptionally difficult to slow down the carriage on a steep hill. A reformer like Peter the Great held the reins in an iron grip and the carriage was safe. A reformer like Alexander II lets the horses run full speed down the hill without the strength to restrain them. So the whole carriage is threatened with destruction. Alexander's private life, meanwhile, was a growing distraction. His affair with Catherine, nearly 30 years his junior, was alienating close friends and family. Catherine was forced to go abroad for a while. But Alexander soon traveled to France under the pretext of visiting the World Fair to be with her. They walked the Grand Boulevards of Paris hand in hand. Alexander wrote to Catherine, I am madly in love with you. These wonderful days we spend together make me infinitely happy. The lovers did not know they were being constantly watched by agents of the French secret police. But they couldn't keep him safe. Polish nationalist Anton Berezovsky made the second attempt on Alexander's life. He shot at Alexander as he was riding in an open carriage with the French Emperor Napoleon III, but the bullet hit the horse. Alexander became accustomed to constant danger. When Russia went to war once more with Turkey, he went to visit troops at the front and came under fire several times. The war was triggered by the Muslim Turks' brutal treatment of Orthodox Bulgarians. Russia now intended to liberate Bulgaria from the Turkish yoke. The war ended in complete victory for Russia. Bulgaria became an independent state, and the name Alexander II Tsar Liberator is still commemorated during each service in every Bulgarian church. On April 2nd, 1879, as the emperor was returning from his morning walk, 
he was greeted by a passerby. Alexander replied absent-mindedly, then noticed the passerby was holding a gun. 60-year-old Alexander, Emperor of Russia, King of Poland, Grand Duke of Finland, made a zigzag run for his life. This third attempt was made by a 33-year-old ex-student, Alexander Salaviev, member of the secret revolutionary society Land and Freedom. He was also working alone. After giving chase to the emperor, he fired several times from a range of 10 yards and missed. A new left-wing terrorist group, the People's Will, soon emerged. Its leaders, Sofia Perovskia and Andrei Zhelyabov, began planning a less amateurish attempt on the Tsar's life. The fourth attempt was made in November 1879. Zhelyabov's group planted a mine with an electric detonator under the railway track as the emperor traveled to the town of Alexandrovsk. But the mine failed to explode. The fifth attempt was made by Perovsky's group. They planted another mine under the railway tracks outside Moscow. But the Tsar's train left early and the terrorists blew up the wrong train. On May 22, 1880, Empress Maria died. After just 40 days mourning, Alexander married Catherine Dalkarukova, who took the title Princess Yurievskia. The wedding took place in secret, in a small room at the palace of Zaskia Selo, because both the Tsar's family and public opinion opposed the marriage. The emperor was now guarded more closely than ever, but still was not safe. The sixth attempt was made by Stepan Kalturin, a member of the People's Will, who'd been hired as a carpenter at the Winter Palace. Over six months, he smuggled 30 kilos of dynamite into a cellar under the Tsar's dining room. The resulting explosion killed 11 people and wounded 56, all of them staff. The emperor had left the dining room to meet a late guest. The emperor wrote to his son, asking that if the worst should happen, he must care for his wife and young children. On his windowsill, Alexander began to find dead pigeons torn to shreds. It turned out a kite had made its home on the palace roof. It was caught. The bird was so incredibly large, it was sent to the cabinet of curiosities. The hunted emperor, exhausted and sick, dreamt of only one thing, to abdicate in favor of his eldest son and leave for Nice with his wife and children. But one important task remained. He had ordered work to begin on the introduction of an elected assembly. It was to be Russia's first step towards a parliament and constitution. Alexander had already approved it. On March 4, 1881, it was to be put before the ministerial cabinet and then announced to the public. On March 1st, the emperor traveled to the Mikolovsky Manege to see the trooping of the color. On his way back, he visited his sister, Grand Duchess Catherine, at Mikolovsky Castle. They drank tea and talked about his plans to leave for Nice. At 2.10 p.m., the emperor left in his carriage. He had to be at the Winter Palace by three o'clock, as he promised to take a walk with his wife. The emperor's carriage turned onto the embankment along the Catherine Canal. Six Cossacks accompanied the carriage, three on either side. Officers of the guard, including the chief of police, followed in two sledges. A boy carrying a bread basket was running along the pavement. 
Alexander saw a woman make a signal with a white handkerchief. When a man with a packet in his hands appeared before the carriage, he realized there would be an explosion. The seventh attempt on Alexander's life was made by Nicholas Rusikov, a 20-year-old student and member of the People's Will. It was Sofia Perovskia who had given the signal. Rusikov threw a handmade bomb at the carriage. The blast killed two Cossacks and a passing boy, injured three horses, and shattered the Emperor's bulletproof coach. But the Emperor was unharmed. Rusikov was quickly apprehended. The chief of police rushed up to Alexander. The Emperor remained calm. I offered him my sledge to go back to the palace. All right, he said, but show me the criminal first. Everyone begged the emperor to leave, but he insisted on seeing Rusikov. Alexander looked his would-be assassin in the eyes. He had survived the seventh attempt. Everything was behind him now but innocent people had been hurt because of him. Alexander wanted to see the wounded. The chief of police followed. After we'd taken no more than three steps, I was deafened by a second explosion. Amid the smoke and fog, I heard His Highness's weak voice cry, help. I tried to lift him, saw that His Highness's legs were completely shattered. The second bomber was 25-year-old Ignaty Grinovitsky, who blew himself up along with the Emperor. Alexander's last words were, hurry home, I want to die in the palace. Alexander died an hour later in his study at the Winter Palace. Grand Duke Alexander, the Emperor's nephew, wrote, a huge crowd gathered outside the Winter Palace. Nobody spoke. Wide, dark bloodstains left a trail up the marble steps and along the corridor to the Emperor's study. We realized our idealized vision of Russia, with its Tsar father and loyal people, no longer existed. The future of not only the Russian Empire, but the entire world, now depended on the outcome of the imminent battle between the new Russian Tsar and the elements of negation and destruction. Alexander II had given his country freedoms it had been demanding for centuries. But it turned out he had also unleashed a dangerous new force, revolution. October 28th, 1888. 
20 miles south of Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine. The Imperial train was en route from Crimea to St. Petersburg. Emperor Alexander III and his family were gathered in the train's elegant dining carriage. Those in the forward carriages were killed instantly. Children could be heard crying. It was unclear who was alive and who was dead. The emperor struggled to his feet, taking the full weight of the carriage roof on his shoulders. He had one thought, to save his family. But how long would his strength hold? By 1881, the Russian Empire was one of the largest states in the world and occupied one-sixth of the world's land surface. But despite the liberal reforms of Alexander II, Russia's economy was in crisis. During Alexander II's reign, production of cast iron rose 67%, while in Germany, it rose 319%. Russia's foreign debt grew from 2 billion to 6 billion rubles. Corruption flourished like never before. Senior officials were being offered bribes of up to 200,000 rubles, about $5 million today. Russia was in a fever. Decades of discontent and repression had created the empire's first terrorists. The radical group, the People's Will, had declared open season on the emperor and killed him at the eighth attempt. His successor inherited an empire in crisis. Chapter 1. Alexander III Alexandrovich. He was not expected to become emperor. As the second son of Alexander II, it was assumed Grand Duke Alexander would follow a military career. It was his elder brother, Nicholas, who was Tsarevich and heir to the imperial throne. But during a tour of Europe, Nicholas fell seriously ill. He was diagnosed with meningitis and died a few months later, aged just 21. Alexander spent a lot of time at his brother's bedside, alongside Nicholas's fiancée, Princess Dagmar of Denmark. They were united by grief. Little by little, Alexander fell in love with gentle Minnie, as her family called her. When they were alone, looking at some photo albums one day, Alexander finally found the courage to speak to her of marriage. The marriage was a happy one. After converting to orthodoxy, Minnie took the name Maria Fyodorovna. They had four sons and two daughters and lived together happily for 28 years. Only Alexander's death would separate them. During the Russian Revolution, Maria left for Denmark where she lived to an old age, always refusing to believe the Bolsheviks had shot her sons. When Alexander III was crowned emperor in 1881, he was 36 years old and clear in his purpose. It was obvious to him that his father's liberal reforms had weakened the economy and fractured society. He intended to reassert Russian autocracy. 
magistrates' courts and village assemblies were abolished. Merchants and shopkeepers were deprived of the vote. Strict censorship was reintroduced. Fifteen publications were closed down for their liberal views, while 300 book titles were withdrawn from libraries, including anything considered critical of the Tsar or his government. A new university charter abolished the independence of universities, introduced compulsory student uniforms, and increased tuition fees fivefold. The children of servants were henceforth to be excluded from the top secondary schools. Despite such reactionary policies, this was an age of dramatic progress. Russia got its first oil wells and steel rolling mills. There were electric lights and paved streets, clean running water and flushing toilets, bustle dresses, bowler hats, steamships, the telegraph, electric trams and Ericsson telephones. On Alexander's personal initiative, Russia's first telephone line was laid between St. Petersburg and the Imperial Palace at Kachina. Kachina also became the first palace to get electricity, one of comparatively few extravagances allowed by Alexander III. In most respects, the emperor was very frugal. He halved the number of courtiers, reduced the number of balls, and cut spending on food and wine. Hunting, however, remained a favorite royal pastime. Alexander was a keen sportsman and excellent shot. But most of all, he loved fishing. He would return from his fishing trips with perch for the empress to fry with potatoes. And then, they were perfectly content. His other great passion was cigars. Alexander was a loving and playful father. One day in the garden, he crept up behind his youngest son, Michael, and soaked him with a hose. A few days later, while his father was smoking a cigar out of his study window, Michael hauled a bucket of water up the stairs and poured it on him from the floor above. The emperor was six foot four, barrel-chested and massively strong. He could bend an iron poker into a knot and roll a five kopeck coin into a tube. His personal habits were plain and unpretentious. He got up at seven, made himself coffee and drank it without sugar or cream. Then he took his favorite dog Kamchatka for a walk before listening to ministers' reports for a few hours. He saved breakfast till 1 p.m. Tea, hard-boiled eggs and rye bread. Between 3 and 5, he went for a walk with the Empress and their children, whatever the weather. At 8 p.m., dinner was served. The Emperor loved good food. Crayfish soup or fish pie, a side of mutton with kasha and pickled cucumbers. He then returned to work, often until late at night. The emperor made frequent tours of Russia. Sergei Vita, a railway manager who often accompanied him, witnessed scenes that were impossible to imagine about the emperor's daily life. After everyone else had gone to bed, I often saw the emperor's valet, Kortov, mending the emperor's trousers. One night, when passing by and seeing him at work, I asked, can't you take a few pairs with you so that if there's a hole in one pair, you can give another pair to the emperor? He replied, just try. If he started wearing a pair of trousers or a jacket, he'll wear them until they fall apart at the seams. Alexander's reign saw the a la Russe style come into fashion. Dresses, decorations, interiors, and the emergence of a distinct style of architecture known as Russian Revival, a reinvention of traditional Russian styles, 
culminating in the upper trading rows that face onto Moscow's Red Square and the city's state historical museum. Alexander supported artists who dealt with themes from Russian history and myth, like the painters Vaznetsov and Surikov. But the other side to this flourishing of Russian national culture was the oppression of minorities seen as non-Russian, especially Russia's Jews. After 1791, Jews were forced to live in the empire's western provinces, an area known as the Pale of Settlement. Alexander II had relaxed controls on Jewish settlement for those engaged in certain useful professions. Jews had begun to play a greater role in Russian business, cultural and intellectual life. But now, Alexander III imposed stricter controls. In 1891, 20,000 Jews were evicted from Moscow and sent to live in the Pale of Settlement. While a cap was imposed on the proportion of Jewish students at any school or university, 10% within the Pale, 5% outside it, and 3% in St. Petersburg. This persecution encouraged many young Jews to join illegal revolutionary groups. Alexander III intended to unify his vast empire through strong autocratic government. And his reign saw the construction of one great physical embodiment of his vision, the Trans-Siberian Railway. Trans-Siberian is more than 9,000 kilometers long, the longest railway line in the world. Its longest and most complex sections were built during Alexander's reign, from the Urals to Vladivostok, 7,000 kilometers across mountains, Taiga and Siberian rivers. It was a spectacular achievement. Between 2,500 and 5,000 kilometers of rails were laid each year. The cost was approximately 1 million rubles, worth around 20 billion US dollars today. Alexander's reign witnessed Russia's great railroad boom. Travel by rail was suddenly prestigious, fashionable, and for some, luxurious. On October 17, 1888, the emperor and his family were returning from Crimea to St. Petersburg. The train was running slightly late, so the driver picked up speed as they approached Kharkiv, reaching 70 kilometers per hour. The train, pulled by twin locomotives, included a luggage van, workshop, a carriage for the Minister of Railways, two kitchen carriages, a dining carriage, and several carriages for the imperial family, the servants and guards. The 15-carriage train was 300 meters long and weighed 480 tons. Safety regulations stipulated a top speed of just 37 kilometers per hour. It was doing almost twice that speed. At 2.14 p.m., the train derailed. Ten out of fifteen carriages were completely destroyed. The dining carriage, containing the imperial family, was flung down the embankment and had its roof torn off. Ten-year-old Grand Duke Michael was buried beneath the wreckage and only freed with difficulty. 20 people were killed and 37 injured. The emperor helped to search the wreckage while the empress tended the wounded. They left for Kharkiv only when darkness fell. On the way, the emperor remembered a discussion he'd overheard on the train a month before. Sergei Vita, manager of the local railway, had been arguing that such a heavy train shouldn't travel at such speeds. Vita himself later recalled the discussion. The Minister of Railways started arguing with me. He said, we travel at the same speed on the other railways. No one has ever dared demand the Emperor's train reduce speed. 
I broke down and said to the minister, let others do what they want. As for me, I don't want to break the emperor's neck. Because if you go on like this, that's what you'll do. Alexander III summoned Vita to St. Petersburg and persuaded him to become director of state railways. It was not a profitable move for Vita. His previous salary of 40,000 rubles at a privately owned rail firm fell to just 8,000. So the emperor personally paid him an extra 8,000 rubles a year as compensation. Within two years, Vita was made Minister of Railways and Minister of Finance. Thanks in large part to his efforts, Russia began to emerge from its economic crisis. Over the next decade, coal output rose by 110%, oil by 1,468%, steel by 159%, and cast iron by 487%. Russian agriculture accounted for 15% of the world's wheat production and 55% of its rye. The growth rate of Russian industry doubled to around 9% thanks largely to an influx of foreign investment, particularly from France. Russia's gold reserves more than doubled. And by 1893, the Russian state was running an annual surplus of almost 100 million rubles. The Russian ruble became a safe haven currency, while Russia's economic boom gave the empire new authority on the world stage. Alexander began to modernize Russia's armed forces. The army was equipped with the new 30 caliber Mosin Nagon bolt action rifle, which remained in service until the mid 20th century. A new, more comfortable uniform was introduced, including a soldier's tunic that remains in use today. Standards in military education were raised. The Navy received 114 new warships, including 17 battleships and 10 armored cruisers. Russia's navy was now the third largest in the world, lagging only behind Great Britain and France. Russia, however, fought no major wars during Alexander's 13-year reign. On the contrary, Alexander's efforts to diffuse tension between the great powers earned him the nickname the peacemaker. But the changing alliances of his reign would have far-reaching repercussions. Russia's traditional alliance with Germany came to an end. Alexander made a new alliance with France instead, the country that had provided the bulk of the loans that enabled Russia's economic miracle. The new Franco-Russian alliance led Germany to fear encirclement a major factor in the outbreak of World War I. That war was a catastrophe Alexander III may have been able to prevent. But after the train crash, his health began to fail. The emperor had been ignoring chronic back pain for many years. In September 1894, he was diagnosed with nephritis, an acute inflammation of the kidneys. His doctors prescribed a strict diet and sent him to recuperate at the Imperial Palace of Levadia in the warmer climes of Crimea. On October 19th, the government courier left Levadia with papers signed by Alexander for the last time. The emperor received the last rites and bid farewell to his wife and children. He died at 2.15 p.m. Alexander III was only 49. The emperor's coffin was taken by train from Crimea to Kharkiv, Oriel, Moscow, and finally St. Petersburg. It was met along the route by huge crowds who came to say goodbye to the emperor. There had never been such a lengthy and solemn funeral. 
No one could have imagined it would be the last funeral of a Tsar that Russia would ever see. The Russian Empire was at the peak of its economic and political power when Alexander's eldest son, 26-year-old Nicholas, ascended the throne. Chapter 2, Nicholas II Alexandrovich. Nicholas, or Nicky as his family called him, received an excellent education and had all the skills required to thrive at court. He was clever, refined and extremely charming. In 1886, Princess Victoria Alex Helena Louise Beatrice of Hesse-Darmstadt, or Alex as she was known, came to Russia to visit her sister, Grand Duchess Elizabeth, who had married Nicholas's uncle. Nicholas and Alex soon fell in love. Nicky's parents did not approve of the match. They found her cold and aloof and too tall. But their son's devotion to her was soon apparent. The young couple used to play a game using the precious stones in their rings to cut each other's names into the glass of the palace windows. It became a tradition and their messages of love remained etched into the windows of the Winter Palace for years to come. Young Nicholas gave a brooch with a 12 carat diamond to his beloved. The gift became a symbol of their love. It was later found amongst her burnt clothes. Alex did not part with it until the last minute of her life. When Nicholas's father, Alexander III, realized he was dying, he agreed to his son's marriage. In 1894, after eight years of waiting, Nicholas and Alex became engaged. She converted to orthodoxy and took the name Alexandra Fyodorovna. A month after Alexander III's death, they were married. On May 14, 1896, the new emperor and empress were crowned in Moscow's Cathedral of the Assumption. The festivities were to last 20 days. For the nobility, there were receptions, balls and full-dress dinners. On May 18th, a traditional festival was to be held for commoners at Kodinka Field, where there would be entertainment, meals and gifts for all. Each gift included smoked sausage, 200 grams, a bread roll with raisins, 400 grams, a Vyasma treacle cake, 130 grams, sweets and nuts, 300 grams, and a commemorative mug bearing the new Tsar's monogram, all wrapped up in a handkerchief. 30,000 buckets of beer and 10,000 buckets of mead were laid on. The cost to the state was 339,536 rubles. The organizers expected an attendance of 400,000, but more than a million turned up. There were wild rumors about the gifts. Some said that if you got one wrapped in a handkerchief with houses printed on it, you would get a new house. Others claimed every mug contained a gold ruble. When word went round that there wouldn't be enough gifts for everyone, there was a stampede. There were barely 2,000 police to hand, powerless in the face of such numbers. The crowd became a huge, struggling mass. Some were crushed, others trampled underfoot. 1,389 people were killed. At 10.30, the emperor was told about the unfolding disaster at Kodinka Field. Everyone expected him to go there immediately, but he did not arrive until 2 p.m. Only the royal household knew that he and his wife had spent the intervening hours praying in private. Four days later, the imperial couple attended a long-standing engagement, a ball at the French embassy. 
They were there for barely 10 minutes. But even so, news quickly spread that the emperor was going to parties while the rest of the city mourned. Far fewer people were aware that Nicholas had given 90,000 rubles of his own money to help the victims' families. Instead, people got the impression the emperor cared very little about ordinary Russians. Some said the Kodinka field disaster was a bad omen for the rain, and noted the Tsar was born on May 6th, the day of Job the long-suffering. And soon, there were more dire predictions. In 1801, shortly before his murder, Emperor Paul I had written a letter to his descendants to be opened a hundred years after his death. Now it was time to open the letter. Only a few trusted servants knew of its existence. One of them was Maria Geringer, the Empress's close friend and senior lady-in-waiting. She later recalled how, on the morning of March 12, 1901, both the Emperor and Empress began the day excited and cheerful. They were going to Gachina Palace to uncover a century-old mystery. They prepared for the trip as if for a merry excursion that promised great entertainment. They departed in high spirits, Maria remembered, but returned thoughtful and gloomy. They told no one what they had read in the letter. But after the trip, the emperor began to refer to 1918 as a fateful year for himself and for the dynasty. According to legend, the letter contained Paul's account of his conversation with a monk named Abel, the Russian Nostradamus. Abel was said to have foretold the death of Catherine the Great Paul's own murder, the war against Napoleon, the burning of Moscow, the revolt of the Decembrists in the reign of Nicholas I, Alexander II's abolition of serfdom, the assassination of Alexander II, and the order and peace of the reign of Alexander III. Of Nicholas II, he said, the holy Tsar, who is like Job the long-suffering, he will have the mind of Christ, the patience and purity of a dove. A crown of thorns will replace his Tsar's crown. He shall be betrayed by his people, as was the Son of God. A great war will be fought. People will fly in the air like birds and swim underwater like fish. They shall destroy each other with stinking sulfur. Treason shall grow and multiply. On the eve of victory, the Tsar's throne will fall. Blood and tears will water the earth. A peasant with an axe will take power. And the plagues of Egypt will begin. Romanov, Nicholas Alexandrovich, age 29, religion Russian Orthodox. Married, children, one daughter Olga, one year old. Military rank, Colonel of the Liebgard Hussar Regiment. Occupation, ruler of Russia. In 1897, a census was carried out of the Russian Empire. Its results were published in 89 volumes and included information on nearly 129 million people. In the year of the census, the Empress was pregnant for a second time. Everybody hoped it would be a boy, an heir. Instead, they had another daughter, Tatiana. Then a third, Maria. And a fourth, Anastasia. Many relatives didn't even try to hide their disappointment. The emperor never worried about it. But the need for a son obsessed the empress. In 1903, the couple prayed for a son over the relics of St. Seraphim at Sarov Monastery. And on August 12th, 1904, Tsarevich Alexei was born. But the proud parents were soon filled with dread. One doctor after another visited the palace. By the third day, it was confirmed. Their son had haemophilia 
and could die at any moment. Hemophilia is a hereditary genetic disease that prevents blood clots forming, meaning even a small cut can lead to death from blood loss. The disease, which is incurable, normally only appears in males, though the gene is also carried by females. Alexei's mother, Empress Alexandra, received the gene from her grandmother, Queen Victoria. Victoria passed the gene on to many of her children and grandchildren, who married into ruling families across Europe. Hence, haemophilia also became known as the royal disease. A minor cut or bruise could be life-threatening for Alexei. At such moments, reports on his recovery became front-page news, alongside latest reports from the Russo-Japanese War. By 1900, the Far East had become the latest focus of great power rivalry. China, weak and undeveloped, was considered ripe for exploitation. Japan, the emerging power in the region, had its sights set on expansion into Korea and Manchuria, the northeastern province of China. Russia had its own designs on Manchuria and stood in Japan's way. Many months of negotiations proved fruitless. The two nations seemed locked on a collision course. There were also those in Russia who thought war might be a good thing to unite the people and calm unrest at home. In February 1904, Japan launched a preemptive strike on the Russian Pacific Fleet at its base in Port Arthur. A year-long siege followed, leading to the port's surrender. The next year, in February 1905, the Russian army was decisively beaten at the Battle of Mukden. Then in May, Russia suffered a devastating naval defeat at the Battle of Tsushima. Nicholas had had enough. His advisors argued that Japan's military strength was ebbing, while Russia's would only increase with time. They only needed one more year, a million rubles, and 20,000 more lives. But the emperor was adamant. They must make peace. The Treaty of Portsmouth was not a harsh settlement, but the damage to Russian prestige had already been done, and the consequences at home were disastrous. It would lead to revolution. In January 1905, workers went on strike in St. Petersburg, Riga, and Warsaw. In May, Ivanova textile workers followed suit, and in June, the crew of the battleship Potemkin mutinied. In October, a general strike was supported by two million workers. All major factories and railways were shut down. Nicholas turned to his father's old advisor, Sergei Vita, who persuaded him that political concessions could no longer be avoided. The October Manifesto, drafted by Vita and signed by Nicholas, promised new civil liberties, including freedom of speech, assembly and association, and the creation of a new national assembly, the Duma. But the unrest only grew. There was only one province where order was maintained, Saratov. So Nicholas summoned its governor, 44-year-old Pyotr Stolipin, to St. Petersburg. After a long conversation with him, the emperor realized it was Stolipin, not Vita, who was the man to pull Russia out of its current crisis. Stolipin was appointed Minister of the Interior and two months later became Prime Minister. He clamped down on protests by introducing martial law. Then he began a major reform of Russian agriculture. Peasants were to be helped to buy land and set up new farms with the help of cheap government loans. Over six years, the government issued more than one billion rubles in loans. Six million farmers, 44%, applied to buy land with government help. Of those, 10% succeeded in becoming new landowners. Crop yields rose by a third. 
the Russian Empire reached its economic peak in 1913. Annual growth in Russian agricultural output was 2%, ranked first in the world. Growth in industrial output was 5%, ranked first in the world. Population growth was 1.5%, ranked first in Europe. The Russian Empire's national income was 16.4 billion rubles, ranked fourth in the world. Russia's total industrial output was worth more than 6.5 billion rubles, ranked fifth in the world. Stolypin's reforms were expected to take 20 years to bear fruit. But it was time that Russia and Stolypin did not have. In 1911, at the Kiev Opera House, Prime Minister Stolypin was assassinated by a socialist revolutionary. Three years later, World War I broke out. It would claim the lives of 37 million people and destroy four empires, the Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman, German, and Russian. Two alliances dominated Europe. Germany, Austro-Hungary, and Italy formed the Triple Alliance. Russia, Britain, and France formed the Triple Entente. When war broke out, Turkey and Bulgaria joined the Triple Alliance. Italy, Romania, and America sided with the Entente. Each country had its own war aims. Germany sought to dominate its European neighbors and claim new overseas colonies. France wanted to recover Alsace and Lorraine, lost to Germany in 1871. Austro-Hungary looked to defeat Slav nationalism within the empire and on its borders. Britain wanted to eliminate Germany as a colonial rival and also had ambitions in the Middle East. Italy wanted to expand its influence in the Balkans, while Russia, fighting alongside Britain and France, was determined to assert its role as defender of the Slavs. The pretext for war came in June 1914, when Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was shot dead in Sarajevo by a Slav nationalist, Gavrilo Princip. Many Russians welcomed the declaration of war against Germany and Austro-Hungary that summer. But when the Russian army advanced through Poland, it suffered a string of catastrophic defeats. The following year, the Russian commander-in-chief, the emperor's cousin, Grand Duke Nicholas, was dismissed from his post. The emperor himself became the army's commander, though it was only a symbolic role, and he did not interfere with strategy. The German army, meanwhile, proved a formidable enemy. In the summer of 1915, the Russian army conducted a giant strategic withdrawal in the face of the German onslaught. It was hoped that by sacrificing territory, Russia could buy enough time to mobilize its vast resources. The following year, 1916, the Russian army launched the Brusilov Offensive, striking a hammer blow against Austro-Hungarian forces. Another major offensive was prepared for 1917, but at home, events were spiraling out of control. While Nicholas was away at army headquarters, his wife's influence on policy grew considerably. It was a cause of growing resentment, not least because the Empress was German by birth. Now, her close relationship with a wandering holy man from Siberia, Grigory Rasputin, caused further unease. To some, he was a visionary and healer. To others, a fraud. There were many rumors about the relationship between the Empress and Rasputin. She had complete faith in him because he seemed the only person able to relieve the suffering of her sickly son, Alexei. Empress Alexandra was certain. With Rasputin by his side, Alexei would live. I believe in our friend's wisdom, she wrote to the emperor. God sent him to be your help and your guide.
Alexandra's regular letters to the emperor contained advice from Rasputin on many matters, even the conduct of the war. To many, Rasputin's hold over the imperial family was shameful and intolerable. It came to an end in December 1916 when Rasputin was murdered by a group of nobles determined to protect the Tsar's reputation. On February 22, 1917, Nicholas II left the capital for army headquarters. The same day, Tsarevich Alexei fell ill with measles. His sisters soon caught it too. All their heads were shaved. The Empress was supervising the care of her sick children when news arrived of strikes in the capital. The Russian Revolution had begun. On February 28th, the Emperor rushed back from the front to be with his family at Zaskia Selo. The next night, the Emperor's train was halted near Novgorod. The line ahead was blocked by revolutionary troops. A great shame. I failed to reach Zaskia Selo. All my thoughts and feelings are there. God help us. The Emperor traveled instead to Peskov, headquarters of the Northern Front. He planned to redeploy troops from the front to crush the revolt in the capital. But behind his back, General Alexeyev, acting commander-in-chief, was sending telegrams to the front commanders asking if it was desirable for the Emperor to abdicate. All of them answered, yes. On the night of March 2nd, Nicholas signed his abdication in the saloon carriage of the Imperial train as it stood at the platform in Peskov station. From that moment on, he was Colonel Nicholas Romanov. Witnesses were struck by his calmness. One general remembered he abdicated the throne as if relinquishing command of a division. Nicholas wrote in his diary, the bottom line is that to save Russia and keep the army at the front, I need to take this step. The emperor's abdication had been demanded by a wide range of political and military figures. They were responding to the crisis unfolding within Russia. The war had led to huge casualties at the front, as well as bread queues, shortages and inflation at home. Soldiers and civilians wanted political change. Nicholas's abdication was demanded by the State Duma as the only way to achieve political progress. It was also demanded by the army, whose generals reported that many of their men sympathized with the revolutionaries and could no longer be relied upon to fight for the Tsar. Amongst the Romanovs, there was no agreement on the monarchy's future. Some disliked or blamed the emperor and his wife. Others believed the monarchy did need to make changes, though none of the Grand Dukes were prepared to take responsibility for making them. Once it was clear that he himself was the obstacle, Nicholas abdicated in favor of his younger brother, Michael. Michael, the favorite youngest son of Alexander III, who had tipped the bucket of water on his father's head, refused to take the throne and issued his renunciation the next day, March 3rd. He would later be shot by the Bolsheviks near Perm in Siberia. His manifesto of March 3rd, 1917, stated that he, Michael Romanov, would not accept the throne until a constituent assembly made up of the people's representatives had voted on a new form of government for Russia. Only then, with the people's consent, would he accept the throne. His grand gesture, however, was quickly overtaken by events. 
the throne would never be offered to him. The monarchy was finished. 300 years of Romanov rule in Russia were at an end. Power now lay with Russia's provisional government. Nicholas, his wife and five children were put under house arrest in the Alexander Palace on the outskirts of St. Petersburg. Six months later, the provisional government sent the former Tsar and his family to the remote Siberian town of Tobolsk, more than a thousand miles from Moscow, for their own safety. Palace staff who wished to join them were allowed to do so. Family were joined in exile by 45 of their former servants. By now, Nicholas must have realized he would not be allowed to leave the country and that Russia was sliding into chaos. The most frightening of Abel's predictions was coming true before his eyes. In October 1917, the Bolsheviks seized power in the capital. The Romanovs were moved from Tobolsk to Yekaterinburg and settled in a so-called house of special purpose. Only five people were allowed to stay with the family. Their doctor, a valet, a maid, a cook and kitchen boy. Nicholas and Alexandra tried to ignore the rudeness of the guards. Theft was what bothered them most. The couple feared that two boxes of papers containing Nicholas's diaries and their personal correspondence would disappear. I could never have imagined that there was such perfect happiness in the world, Alex had once written to Nicholas. I love you. These three words are my whole life. In the middle of the night, the Emperor's family and their servants were ordered to get up and gather in one of the rooms. They were told that because of the threat of local unrest, they were to be moved to a new location for their own safety. Alexei was sick, so his father carried him in his arms. The family were ordered down into the cellar and told to arrange themselves for a photo, which would be used to quash rumors of their death. Then Yakov Yurovsky, the house commandant, entered the room. He announced that they had been sentenced to death by the Presidium of the Ural Soviet. In the early hours of July 17, 1918, the following people were executed in the cellar of the house. Nicholas Romanov, aged 50. Alexandra Romanova, aged 46. Olga Romanova, aged 23. Tatiana Romanova, aged 21. Maria Romanova, aged 19. Anastasia Romanova, aged 17, Alexei Romanov, aged 14, and four servants. In 2000, Tsar's murdered family were canonized as saints 
by the Russian Orthodox Church. In spring 1918, a few months before her death, Grand Duchess Olga wrote, My father asked me to tell those who remained loyal to him that they should not avenge him, as he has forgiven all and prayed for all. He asked them to remember that the evil which is now in the world will become even stronger, but evil will not triumph over evil. Only love.